there were rumors some humans survived the cull. Our mission was to hunt them down and eradicate them from the galaxy. Standing on the bridge of the starship Veritas, I surveyed the twinkling cosmos stretched out before me. The ancient celestial map, a sacred gift from the Keepers of the Light, shimmered holographically in the air. It whispered tales of an old universe and hinted at places untraveled. An eon ago, humanity was put on trial. Their entire species stood accused in the Galactic Council's court, their future hanging on the balance of cosmic justice. The charges? Their uncontrolled expansion, their reckless consumption of resources, and their chronic propensity for violence. Their whole nature, it was determined, was detrimental to the galactic order. Humanity was not present at their trial. There were no advocates, no pleas for mercy, no testimonies to the wonders of their art or the depths of their love. There was only the data, the cold, hard facts of their impact on the cosmos. And so, the proclamation was raised humanity would be removed from the face of the galaxy. As the executor of this grim sentence, the cold fell to us. We were not driven by malice or joy, but duty. We were the Veritans, the arbitrators of the Galactic Council, tasked with ensuring harmony among the stars. In our hearts, we carried not hatred, but a heavy sorrow. Even as we extinguished their lives, we recognized that each was a unique constellation of memories, dreams, and potential, now lost forever. The initial chaos was a whirlwind of desperate flight and fierce resistance. Human ships scattered in a thousand directions, their primitive but potent weapons flaring in the void. Yet, one by one, we found them. One by one, we ended them. Their desperation was as futile as it was poignant, a testament to their undying spirit, even in the face of inevitable defeat. A thousand years have passed since the cold began. Peace had returned to the galaxy, yet a single task remained incomplete. Rumors persisted whispers in the dark corners of spaceports, cryptic anomalies in deep space probes. A few human ships may have slipped through our net in the initial chaos. I turned to my second in command, Thera. Her form was as ethereal as the cosmic dust that hung in the emptiness of space, her gaze as cold as the distant stars. She had served at my side since the beginning, her resolve never faltering, even in our darkest hours. The map, I said, gesturing towards the holographic starscape. It's our best chance. The keepers have never led us astray before. Thera nodded, her gaze thoughtful. I still find it hard to believe. Could humans have survived this long, hidden among the stars? I sighed, my own doubts the mirror of hers. There's only one way to find out. The Veritas shuddered slightly as we engaged the drive, the stars bending around us. The ancient celestial map charted our course, guiding us towards the whispered echoes of a race thought extinct. A race we were sworn to extinguish. As the light of distant suns stretched into lines, I couldn't help but wonder. What would we find at the end of this journey? Desperate survivors clinging to existence, or the last defiant embers of a species refusing to die. The thought sent a shiver down my spine. Despite the weight of our mission, I could not help but admire their resilience. One thing was certain, we were sailing towards the unknown. Humanity, a ghost from our past, had left us a mystery we could not ignore. I turned to the star-strewn expanse before us, the shimmering holograph of the ancient celestial map illuminating my face in a ghostly glow. We were venturing into uncharted territory, the final vestiges of a race we were meant to extinguish. It was a grim task, but our resolve was as strong as ever. From the human perspective, in the heart of the SS Ulysses, nestled amongst the vast cosmic sea, I stood contemplating our destiny. The ancient celestial map spread before me, a testament to our past glory, now held the keys to our future survival. An eon ago, the trial by the Galactic Council was a shock, a clandestine farce conducted without our input, but it didn't catch us entirely off guard. Rumors had circulated amongst our ranks, whispers of conspiracy and impending doom. We knew our rapid ascension had raised concerns, stirred fear among the alien races who were so used to the status quo. We were the new kids on the block, too bold and too powerful for their liking. We'd felt the unspoken tension, the silent exclusion in galactic affairs. We'd seen the covert glances, the veiled threats. And so, even as the Galactic Council schemed our downfall, we plotted our survival. We weren't naive, we knew we were being pushed into a corner, subdued for the greater good. But we were human, we would not go down without a fight. A plan was crafted. A daring, audacious plan to escape the iron fist of the Galactic Council. Even as the gavel was raised in the cosmic courtroom, we were preparing for our great exodus. Our brightest minds poured over the ancient celestial maps, charting a course to the unexplored regions of the galaxy. 
we would be interstellar nomads, the last surviving remnants of our species. As the verdict was announced, a pall fell over humanity. But unbeknownst to the Galactic Council and the Veritans, a considerable part of our fleet had already vanished into the Dark Abyss under the guidance of the ancient celestial maps. The ships that were left behind were not abandoned, they were manned by brave volunteers ready to face the Veritans, to buy time for the rest of us, to protect the future of humanity at all costs. Back in the present, the Ulysses and her crew were not the last humans. We were the guardians of humanity, the watchers on the wall. While we held the fort here, millions of our brethren were safely ensconced in the farthest reaches of the galaxy, their lives going on in blissful ignorance of the game being played on the galactic stage. The thought brought a strange sense of satisfaction. The Veritans thought they were winning, but we had the upper hand. Our spies within the Galactic Council were our eyes and ears. They fed us information, whispers of Veritan plans. Little did the Council know that the seeds of deceit had been sown within their own ranks. Misinformation, misdirection, human skills that the Council feared and underestimated were at play. As the calm beat, breaking my chain of thoughts, a sense of foreboding washed over me. I answered the call, my heartbeat echoing in my ears. They're coming, the voice at the other end said, fear thinly veiled behind the determined tone. Our spy in the Galactic Council was risking his life to warn us. The Veritans have something. An ancient celestial map. They're coming for you. We knew this day would come. The Veritans were the Council's executioners, and they were closing in. We were ready though. This was part of the plan. The Ulysses was a guardian, a diversion, a sacrificial lamb. We were here to keep the Veritans thinking they were winning, to keep them away from the millions of humans nestled safely in the corners of the galaxy. As I looked at the faces of my crew, each one ready to lay down their life for our kind, I knew we would succeed. We would make the Veritans believe they had won. We would make the ultimate sacrifice to protect humanity. The game was far from over. The Veritans were coming, but they were walking into our trap. Little did they know they were being manipulated, their strings being pulled by the very species they sought to destroy. The final act of humanity's saga was unfolding, and the Galactic Council was yet to realize that they were not the puppeteers, but mere puppets in the grand theater of the cosmos. We were on the bridge of the starship Veritas, drifting through the interstellar void. Stars shone like tiny embers scattered across the backdrop of the cosmos, their light painting ghostly images on the holographic displays. The hum of the engines was a constant melody, a soothing companion in the silence of space. Our navigator, an entity known as Elicar, suddenly straightened in his seat. His six eyes widened as he stared at the data on the screen in front of him. Captain, he said, his voice a mere whisper. There's something. It's a ship. The words hung in the air, amplifying the silence on the bridge. After all this time, could this be the break we had waited for? I hurried to Elicar's side, my heart pounding with a strange mix of anticipation and dread. A thousand years had passed since we began our mission, a thousand years of hunting down the remnants of humanity. This could be the end, or the beginning of something new. The data displayed was irrefutable. The celestial map, a maze of constellations and coordinates, had guided us to a human ship, seemingly waiting in the darkness. Its design was archaic, its energy signature weak, yet undeniably human. It bore a name from ancient Earth's history, the SS Ulysses. A shiver of excitement swept through the Veritas as we edged closer. Shields were raised, weapons prepared. We were predators, closing in on our long-awaited prey. Then, unexpectedly, a voice filled the bridge, clear and calm against the tension-ridden silence. Veritas, this is the SS Ulysses. We would like to speak with you. My second in command, Thera, stiffened beside me. The entire crew stared in stunned silence as the calm human voice echoed through the ship. Ignore it, one of my officers advised, a young Veritan named Delera. They're stalling. Strike first and be done with it. But I hesitated, a knot of uncertainty forming in my stomach. What message could these humans have for us, and why now? Ignoring the protests of my crew, I opened a communication channel. The holographic screen displayed a human, standing tall and determined. His eyes held no fear, no desperation, only resolution. We exchanged pleasantries, and then I began to read the proclamation of the Galactic Council, declaring their status as renegades, as being sentenced to extermination. The human interrupted me. His voice was even, controlled. He spoke of change, of strength, of a plea for reintegration into the galactic community. It was an audacious proposition, one that left me speechless. Anger welled up inside me. We, the Veritans, were the arbitrators of justice, tasked with executing the Council's orders, and these humans dared to plead their case after a millennia of silence. My temper flaring, I ended the communication abruptly and gave the order to attack. The Veritas opened fire. 
The silence of space was pierced by the energy blasts from our weapons, streaking towards the SS Ulysses. The first volley hit the human ship, engulfing it in a haze of energy and smoke. A second volley was launched, and then, without warning, a single beam of light shot from the human ship, slicing through our shields like a blade through air. The Veritas trembled under the impact, alarms blaring as the beam tore through our hull. My crew was thrown into disarray as they scrambled to assess the damage. The readings were grim. Our shields were down, our engines crippled. In one swift move, the humans had incapacitated us, leaving us drifting helplessly in the void. In that moment, we were at the mercy of the humans. An eerie silence settled on the bridge of the Veritas, interrupted only by the hum of damaged circuits and the hissing of escaping gas. We waited for the death blow, but it never came. Instead, a hail from the SS Ulysses filled our comms again. We have a message for the Galactic Council, the human said, his voice resounding throughout the ship. Will you deliver it? Stripped of our defenses, we were nothing more than an audience for the humans. Their audacity, their defiance, it was nothing short of a slap in the face. And yet, the bitter reality was clear. Our mission had been upended. Begrudgingly, I nodded to Thera, who re-established the communication channel with the SS Ulysses. The same human appeared on the screen. He stood with an air of triumphant calm, as if the tables had always been destined to turn this way. Humans are not the weak prey you seek, he said, his voice ringing with a finality that echoed through the silent bridge. We are not a species to be exterminated at whim. We have evolved. We have learned. And we refuse to be eradicated. A murmur of disbelief swept through my crew. We offer a truce, he continued. We wish to rejoin the Galactic Federation, to stand as equals among the interstellar races. We want the extermination decree lifted. Deliver our message. Tell them that we seek a retrial. I clenched my fists, the audacity of the humans burning in my chest. My eyes narrowed as I watched him, anger coiling in my stomach. Yet, despite my fury, I found myself intrigued by their proposal. Could it be possible? Could the humans truly have changed? Was there room for them in the Galactic Order? It was a notion that appended everything I had believed. I was duty-bound to the Council, my loyalty unquestioned. But I was also a Veritan, a race known for our adherence to truth, justice, and honor. And I had given my word. So, with a curt nod, I agreed to deliver their message. The human captain offered a nod in return, his eyes filled with a grim determination. His final words echoed through the bridge, a chilling promise that sent shivers down my spine. We will be here in thirty soul rotations. We hope you bring us a fair judgment from the council. We are done running. We are done hiding. We are ready to face the consequences, whether they be peace or war. And with that, the SS Ulysses vanished, its figure dissipating into a flash of light as it leapt into hyperspace. We were left in the echoing silence of its wake, the weight of its departure heavy in the air. For a moment, we sat in silence, each grappling with the encounter. Then, gradually, the Veritas came back to life. Repairs were initiated, damage reports filed, and systems rebooted. Our course was reset, back to the Galactic Council, carrying with us the echoes of humanity's plea. As we limped through the vast emptiness of space, I couldn't help but reflect on the encounter. The humans had changed, that much was evident. But were they ready to rejoin the interstellar community? And if they were, was the Council ready to accept them? The humans had cast their lot, now it was up to the Council to decide their fate. For better or worse, it was clear that humanity had returned, no longer the hunted but a formidable force in its own right. The stage was set, and the next act of this cosmic drama was about to unfold. As I gazed out into the abyss of space, one thought echoed through my mind, an unsettling premonition that left me filled with a strange sense of foreboding. The hunters had become the hunted. From the heart of the new terra, within the hustle of the bustling city of Nova, beneath the shining artificial sky, a conclave of human leaders convened. They were the heroes of their time, veterans of spacefaring, pioneers of interstellar colonization, and guardians of human destiny. Their congregation was one of determination and resolve, echoing the sentiments of the millions who had survived the grand escape. The Veritans have taken our message, Admiral Jonathan Pierce began, his voice booming through the underground conference room. We've made our stand, gentlemen. It's a matter of time before we hear back from the Galactic Council. The room was silent for a moment before General Lena Roswell stood up, her eyes reflecting the resolve of an entire race. We must be prepared for all outcomes, she declared. Our people have thrived against the odds, developed technologies that rivals the most advanced races. We need to show them we won't bow down again. A sequence of nods rippled through the room. Simultaneously, the holographic projections activated at the center of the table, showing the impressive expanse of the human fleet, their most advanced ships taking the front line. We've retrofitted the battleships with our new Tachyon Pulse Cannons, reported fleet engineer Nikolai Rostov. Our shield technology is also far superior to what we had when we fled Earth. We are ready to protect ourselves if need be. 
As the human leaders strategized, the memories of the past millennium resonated in their minds. They had been refugees, fleeing a galaxy unwilling to accept them. Forced to traverse uncharted space, they had arrived in a sector so distant from their original home it felt like a different universe altogether. Yet, they didn't just survive, they thrived. The humans had evolved. The threat of extinction had ignited a fire of innovation, leading to leaps in technology, philosophy, and social structures. They had become a force to be reckoned with, their tenacity fueling their growth. The Galactic Council's judgment had inadvertently forged humans into something stronger, something capable of challenging the pre-established order. Behind the scenes of this transformation was a network of covert operatives, loyal to humanity and its survival. Known only to the highest echelons of human command, these individuals, embedded within various races of the Galactic Council, kept their brethren informed about the Council's deliberations and actions. Agent Oran reported back, said Commander Vega, the head of covert operations. The Galactic Council is divided. Our sudden show of force has some of them worried. Admiral Pierce nodded gravely. It was a gamble to reveal our hand to the Veritans, but it appears to be paying off. The humans knew they were playing a high-stakes game. They also knew they were no longer the underdogs. Over the centuries, they had prepared, evolved, and now they were ready to face whatever decision the Galactic Council might make. As the meeting drew to a close, a shared sentiment echoed through the conference room. Humanity had emerged from the shadows. They had been the renegades of the galaxy, the forgotten ones. Now, they were ready to reclaim their place among the stars, by negotiation or by force, if necessary. Their meeting concluded with a deep-rooted sense of resolve, and one by one, the leaders of New Terra dispersed. As the chamber emptied, Admiral Pierce found himself staring at the now dark holographic table, his mind awash with the memories of a millennium past. Back when they first arrived in this distant sector of the galaxy, they were refugees, barely surviving, clinging onto the dying embers of their civilization. Their early years were marked by struggle, desperation, and countless close calls with extinction. But humans are a resilient species, shaped by adversity, molded by the harsh crucible of survival. This new world, harsh and unfamiliar as it was, didn't conquer them. Instead, it became the anvil upon which a new humanity was forged. In time, they built cities, they terraformed in hospitable landscapes, they charted this strange galaxy. From the ashes of their old civilization, a phoenix had risen. The ruins of old Earth were far behind them. New Terra was now their beacon of hope, their sanctuary amidst the cold vastness of space. Yet, the humans knew that survival alone wasn't enough. If they were to secure their place in the galaxy, they had to be more, they had to evolve. And so, they pursued knowledge, they embraced innovation, they sought the secrets of the universe. Mankind's focus on technology yielded extraordinary results. In the span of a millennium, the technology advanced at an unprecedented rate. The metamorphosis was profound, far beyond their wildest expectations, to the point where they now stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the races that had once judged them as primitive and dangerous. Yet, their most significant achievement, their ace in the hole, was their secret network of agents. Only a few knew about this intricate web of spies that had been spun over centuries. These brave men and women lived among the alien races, always watching, always listening. Their information was invaluable. Every movement of the Galactic Council, every shift in power, every judgment, it all flowed back to New Terra. It was this intelligence that had alerted them about the Veritans and the Council's judgment. It was this network that had bought them the precious time to prepare for the Veritans' arrival. As he walked through the bustling streets of Nova, Admiral Pierce couldn't help but marvel at the sight. Towering structures reaching out to touch the artificial sky, a sky that once seemed like an impossible dream. Humans strolling about, their heads held high, their spirits unbroken. He knew the road ahead was fraught with uncertainty. The Galactic Council's judgment was looming over them. But he also knew this, the humans were not the same race that was banished from their original home. They had evolved, they had prepared, they were ready to fight, and when the Veritans returned, humanity would be waiting. Waiting to negotiate, or waiting to fight. Whatever the future held, they would face it together. As one people. As humans. From the edge of the bustling Rigel system, the Veritas limped back towards the heart of the Galactic Council's territories. The words of the humans echoed in the minds of everyone on board, a chilling reminder of the power they had so hastily underestimated. Captain Varro stood stoically on the bridge, his mind filled with thoughts as he guided the ship towards their destination, the Council's seat on Zeta Prime. Zeta Prime, a colossal station forged from the remnants of a hollowed-out planet, served as the diplomatic and legislative heart of the Galactic Council. The Council itself, a body made up of delegates from hundreds of star systems, convened within its great halls, shaping the laws and policies that governed the galaxy. As the Veritas docked, Captain Varro and his officers were ushered to the Great Council Chamber. They stepped into a circular amphitheater, 
filled with the representatives of countless races, a multitude of voices filling the air in a discordant symphony of debates and discussions. The agenda for today was clear. It was the human issue. The Veritas's encounter with the humans had sent shockwaves throughout the council, forcing them to reconsider the verdict handed down a millennium ago. A delegate from the Nebulant system, its voice a whispering breeze, floated to the center of the room. The humans, they reach out for peace, yet demonstrate a power that could annihilate us. Is this not a ploy? An act of deception? A Yamite delegate responded, its words punctuated by the rhythmic clicks of its mandibles. Or a show of strength, perhaps. They wish us to see that they are not the same as before. The council chamber buzzed with debates. Some argued that the humans were manipulating them, others believed it was a genuine plea for reintegration. A few even suggested that humanity had been punished enough and that they deserved a second chance. Captain Varro, watching the debates, found his own beliefs wavering. He had seen the transformation of the humans firsthand. Their plea, their power, it had all been so unexpected. They had outmaneuvered them, bested them even. Had they been wrong about the humans all along? The debates raged on, the council chamber echoing with the voices of the galaxy, each delegate fighting to be heard. Yet, amidst the chaos, one thing was clear the verdict would not be unanimous. The council was divided, their views on humanity more varied than ever. As Captain Varro left the council chamber, he knew he had a long and arduous task ahead of him. He had to convince the council to give humans a second chance. It was not just a matter of justice, it was a matter of survival. The humans had shown that they were not to be trifled with, and if they were not willing to negotiate, the consequences could be disastrous. The galaxies watched on, their collective breaths held in anticipation. The humans had sown the seeds of dissent, their plea had fractured the unity of the council, and now, the Veritans had a crucial role to play. Would they be the voice of reason, or the harbinger of war? Only time would tell. News of the encounter between the Veritas and the humans rippled through the Galactic Council's territories, racing along communication arrays and quantum links, setting the galaxy alight with apprehension and curiosity. Holovids, interstellar news channels, and data streams all across the galactic sectors exploded with headlines about the humans. It was a topic that every sentient being was discussing, an event that was dissected and debated on a million different worlds. On the shipbuilding platforms of Axion Prime, the engineers and laborers whispered about the terrifying power the humans had displayed. In the bustling trade hubs of the Glees markets, merchants exchanged rumors of an impending war between humanity and the Council. Even in the ancient learning halls of Vega 6, scholars pondered the implications of a resurgent humanity. However, there was another effect, a less tangible but equally potent one. Hope, as it often does, had begun to flicker in the most unexpected places. In the fringes of the galaxy, on worlds that felt the Council's heavy-handed policies and aloof governance, people saw the humans as a symbol of rebellion, a beacon of resistance. Graffiti portraying human symbols began appearing on the streets, and quiet whispers of a possible revolution started to circulate. Back on the Veritas, Captain Varro couldn't help but notice the effect of the human issue on his crew. They were edgy, their usually disciplined demeanor replaced by an underlying current of worry. He decided to address them. Gather round, he began, his deep voice reverberating through the ship's comms. I won't deny that we are facing an unexpected situation. The humans, they have evolved, developed. But we should not let fear cloud our judgment. Remember, we are Veritans, keepers of peace and justice. His words resonated with his crew, the simple yet powerful reassurances bringing a calm to the nervous energy that had pervaded the ship. Finally, a month after their encounter with the humans, the Council made its decision. A special envoy was dispatched, a peace delegation comprising representatives from each of the Council's races, accompanied by a massive fleet, a clear sign of the Council's intentions to negotiate, but from a position of strength. Captain Varro was appointed as the commander of this fleet, a task he accepted with a heavy heart. He knew the task ahead wouldn't be easy. The humans had changed, they had grown stronger, and they had displayed a level of sophistication and power that was unparalleled. As the fleet embarked on their journey back to the location of the human encounter, Captain Varro couldn't help but wonder what lay ahead. Would the humans accept their proposal, or would they see it as another attempt at subjugation? The fate of the galaxy rested on his shoulders, and he hoped that he was up to the task. The galaxy watched on, the tension palpable, as the Veritan-led fleet journeyed to meet the humans. And somewhere, in a remote corner of the cosmos, the humans waited, ready for whatever was coming their way. From the human perspective, Deep within the hallowed chambers of the Galactic Council, unassuming figures flitted through the shadowed recesses, whispering in the ears of the powerful, influencing the mighty. These were the human spies, unseen, unheard, and unknown to most. Infiltrating every level of the Galactic Council, they had been weaving a complex web of influence. For the humans, the stakes were high, and so they played their hand with finesse. 
Bribes were offered to the corruptible, threats were whispered to the vulnerable, and blackmail was a constant tool in their arsenal. And where words failed, acts of sabotage ensured that the human's will was subtly enforced. Meanwhile, the humans also engaged in a crafty game of information warfare. With deft precision, they disseminated false information, crafted intricate lies, and sowed seeds of doubt among the Council's worlds. This not only kept the Council on edge, but also created divisions that the humans could exploit. Despite their extensive network and their manipulations, the humans found themselves in the dark about one critical matter. The Council's peace offer. The decision was cloaked in layers of secrecy, so dense that even the humans' most skilled spies could not penetrate it. Yet, they knew an offer was coming. The signs were clear in the heightened whispers and the silent, anxious glances exchanged among the council members. This knowledge filled the human leadership with a sense of anticipation and uncertainty, a deadly cocktail of emotions in such precarious times. Back on the human stronghold, fleets of starships lay ready, their hulls gleaming under the harsh glare of artificial lights. As the peace delegation's arrival drew closer, an air of tension enveloped the human command. Some called for peace, for an end to their long isolation, others feared the Council's offer would be a ruse, a trap to exterminate humanity once and for all. The decision, however, leaned towards peace. The fleet that would greet the peace delegation would be a singular ship, an imposing warship aptly named the Resurgence. The symbol was not lost on the human leadership. They were willing to negotiate, but not at the expense of their newfound strength and resilience. On board would be Ambassador Idris Solane, a man renowned for his diplomatic prowess and unyielding courage. His presence was a statement. Humanity was ready to negotiate, but it would not be intimidated. Despite their decision to extend a hand of peace, the humans were not naive. Backup plans were laid out like a deck of cards, each more deadly than the last. Lurking in the shadows were two Dreadnought-class battlecruisers and a fleet of nimble, deadly attack vessels ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. Their chosen meeting spot with the Council's envoy was nestled in the Cosmos Expanse, a nebula that offered concealment and a tactical advantage. Its swirling gases and electromagnetic interference would cloak their hidden fleet, offering a significant advantage if things turned sour. The humans knew their survival hinged on their ability to outthink, outmaneuver, and outfight their opponents. This nebula was their hidden ace, and they hoped it wouldn't need to be played. The human race stood on a knife's edge, teetering between newfound hope and the threat of annihilation. They had come far, grown much since the days of their exodus. Now, they were about to face their greatest test yet, a confrontation that could signal their triumphant return or their ultimate doom. As Ambassador Solane took a last look at the bustling command center, he was ready to plead the human's case and bring us back into the galactic fold as equals. As the last strategy sessions ended, and the Dreadnoughts disappeared into the Nebula's mists, one thought echoed throughout humanity's ranks they were ready. For peace, for war, for negotiation, for conflict. Whatever the future held, they were prepared to face it head on. No longer were they the fledglings who had fled their home a thousand years ago. They were a strong, resilient race, ready to reclaim their rightful place among the stars. In the cold vacuum of space, an armada of colossal proportions appeared on the horizon, as if burst from the stars themselves. It was the Veritan fleet, a formidable gathering of vessels that stretched as far as the sensors could read. From behemoth carriers to agile fighters, each craft was an embodiment of Veritan power and sophistication. The Veritas, the command ship, was the epitome of grandeur. Its hull shone like a second sun in the dark void, a testament to the immense power that the Veritans wielded. Outclassing the resurgence in both size and firepower, the vessel radiated an aura of dominion, symbolic of the Galactic Council's intentions. The Veritan fleet arrived in formation, its precision a quiet statement of military discipline. The spectacle was unmistakably a show of strength meant to intimidate. Yet, aboard the resurgence, the humans watched the display unfold with a steadfast calm. They had expected a power play, and it did not phase them. A tense silence filled the command bridge of the resurgence. The soft hum of consoles and the quiet whispers of the crew filled the air as the Veritan fleet filled the star-studded vista before them. The humans held their breath as the colossal fleet drew closer, a tangible embodiment of the trials they would face. As the distance closed, a hailing signal cut through the silence, its origin from the Veritas. The screen flickered to life, revealing the stone-cold face of Captain Varro, his ice-blue eyes boring into the crew of the resurgence. The negotiations were about to begin. The Parley, a grand vessel of diplomacy and negotiation, 
drifted in the vast expanse of space, ensconced between the menacing silhouettes of the human and Veritan fleets. Its stately demeanor bore a symbolic significance, it was the fulcrum of a delicate equilibrium, a precarious stage where power dynamics would be examined, and futures debated. The journey from the human warship resurgence to the diplomatic vessel felt laden with the weight of a thousand years. Aboard a sleek shuttle, Ambassador Idris Solane and his entourage sliced through the cold vacuum of space, the metallic sheen of their vessel glinting under the starlight. Each one bore the burden of their mission, the redemption and reintegration of the human race into the galactic community. Inside the parley, they were greeted with an atmosphere of restrained grandeur. The opulent conference room was a testament to the rich tapestry of galactic cultures. A sweeping fresco adorned the walls, etched with narratives of various galactic council species. Solane, his gaze tracing the elaborate arcs and swirls of alien histories, felt a pang of absence. The human narrative was glaringly absent, a silent reminder that they were outsiders, their place in this tableau still uncertain. Across the table, the Galactic Council's delegation was an eclectic mix. There were stoic Veritans, known for their honor and warrior traditions, mercantile Zalarians, wrapped in robes glittering with trade jewels, scholarly Andorians in their monkish attires, and the towering Krillian enforcers, their hulking forms a display of raw power. Each species represented a piece of the complex mosaic that formed the Galactic Council, a body the humans sought to join. The negotiations began with superficial pleasantries, a civil dance of diplomacy, an assessment of the opposing sides. Once this phase ebbed away, the Council members, led by the formidable Captain Varro, broached the real issues. The past sins of humanity were laid bare, echoing ominously around the room. Accusations of uncontrolled expansion, reckless consumption of resources, and a penchant for violence hung heavy in the air. The Galactic Council sought answers, and Solane stood ready to provide them. This was their time to confront the ghosts of their past, to reclaim their place among the stars. However, the humans did not yet know the Council had an unexpected curveball, one that could either pave their way towards integration or cast them back into the shadows. The first half of this historical negotiation had just begun, and already, the scales seemed perilously balanced. There was a cold, hard edge to the voices of the council representatives as they addressed the human delegation. Their questions were like sharpened knives, intended to cut through the fabric of pretense and reach the heart of humanity's motivations. Yet, Ambassador Solane met them head on, his voice a calm and measured counterpoint to their underlying hostility. Humanity has learned much in its isolation, he began, his eyes locked onto the assembly. We have faced adversity and overcome it. We have grappled with our past and emerged stronger. Our aim today is not just for survival, but for coexistence. As he spoke, Solane painted a vivid picture of the new human civilization. He spoke of their technological advancements, which were geared towards sustainability and balance rather than reckless consumption. He outlined the new governance structures that prioritized consensus over coercion, their cultural shifts that celebrated diversity and peace over division and conflict. Throughout his address, Solane carefully navigated the treacherous waters of the negotiation. He acknowledged humanity's past faults, but he did so by emphasizing the ways in which they had evolved. He offered evidence of their progress, backed up by the hard facts of their thriving civilization. He told stories of individuals who exemplified the best of humanity, of their courage, ingenuity, compassion, and resilience. Yet, when Solane's impassioned defense came to a close, there was a palpable tension in the room. An uncomfortable silence descended, broken only by the hushed whispers of the Galactic Council representatives. Then, the twist that the humans had not anticipated. Varro, his gaze as hard as the hull of his ship, delivered the blow. Your words, Ambassador Solane, hold weight. However, the Council has decided humanity must be retried. Not just for its past crimes, but also its capacity for change, he declared, his voice ringing out in the chamber. This was a curveball the humans had not expected, a retrial for crimes committed an eon ago, and an examination of their potential for transformation. The stakes had just become higher, but humanity was not to be outdone. Solane, his countenance as steady as ever, voiced the counteroffer, if it is proof you require, then proof you shall have. We invite a delegation from the Council to our new homeworld. Come and see for yourselves the society we have built. The proposal took the Council by surprise. Murmurs rippled through the assembly, eyes darted from one representative to another. The humans had played their hand well, offering transparency and a direct solution. To further sweeten the deal, Solane added, We request Captain Varro to be a part of this delegation, along with any other representatives you deem fit. 
Varro's stony visage flickered with surprise. He had not anticipated this. Yet, he was a soldier, and his duty was to the council. His assent was curt, his voice echoing in the Grand Hall, very well. I accept. As the council representatives retreated to their quarters, and the humans to their ship, an uneasy silence enveloped the parley. The negotiation had ended, not with a resolution, but with a promise of scrutiny. Yet, for the humans, this was a victory. Their fate was not yet sealed, their destiny still in their hands. They had been given a chance to prove their worth and to demonstrate their evolution. As the starlight streamed in through the window, Solane stared into the vast expanse, ready for the challenges that lay ahead. The hallways of the resurgence were abuzz with anticipation and guarded optimism, each crew member desperate for news from the parley. Ambassador Solane, alone in his quarters, stared out at the vast expanse of space, his mind teeming with thoughts and plans. It was time to inform the human leadership about the unexpected twist. His holographic screen blinked to life, displaying the worried faces of the human council. Solane didn't mince words, explaining the council's decision to retry humanity and the proposed counteroffer that had been tentatively accepted. Silence filled the communication line as the human council digested the information. Then came the barrage of questions and heated debates, discussions over the potential repercussions, the preparation required, the risk of inviting the council representatives to their homeworld. Yet, amidst the turmoil, one fact stood clear they had a chance to prove their worth, and they needed to seize it. The go-ahead from the council was a clear mandate for Solane. His face set with determination, he returned to the parley, his heart pounding with the weight of humanity's hopes. As the Galactic Council representatives filed into the conference room on the parley, an air of solemnity descended over the room. Varro's gaze met Solane's, an unspoken acknowledgement passing between them. The stakes were high. There was no room for miscalculations. Ambassador Solane, with a firm voice, accepted the Council's terms, humanity agrees to the retrial. We will present our case at the heart of the Galactic Council, where our actions will speak louder than words. The date was set. Sixty soul rotations to prepare their defense, sixty rotations to demonstrate to the delegation the evolution of humanity. The Council promised safe passage, a necessary formality but one that underscored the fragile truce. The meeting concluded with the details of the Council's visit to the human world. Captain Varro would lead the delegation, joined by other council representatives selected for their impartiality and wisdom. Their task was to observe, to explore, and to bear witness to the truth of humanity's evolution. Their findings would form a crucial part of the retrial, potentially swaying the balance in humanity's favor. As the delegates left the room, an eerie silence blanketed the vessel. It was a silence filled with the echoes of the past and the whispers of the future, a reminder of the path that lay ahead. But it was also a silence filled with the resolve and determination of a species ready to reclaim its rightful place among the stars. With the agreement sealed, the space beyond the resurgence came alive, a display of vibrant colors dancing across the vacuum as the human ship initiated the sequence for their version of FTL travel. Unbeknownst to the humans aboard the resurgence, a small craft detached from the Veritan Armada. Its size and design were the culmination of years of Veritan stealth technology, crafted to be almost imperceptible to conventional sensors. As the humans busied themselves with preparations for FTL travel, the craft, a sleek two-seater infiltrator, made its silent approach. On the Veritan flagship, Thera, Captain Varro second in command watched the ghost-like readings of the infiltrator on the screen. Her face was etched with a grim determination as she initiated a secure line, and Filtrator Zeta has successfully attached to the human vessel. They remain oblivious. The reply came swift and icy. Good. A collective gasp filled the room as the Galactic Council delegates watched, awestruck at the demonstration of advanced technology, a stark contrast to the primitive species they'd imagined. Captain Varro's, stoic and composed, couldn't help but feel a twinge of apprehension as they prepared to venture into unknown territory. The humans were a mystery, an enigma that had sprung from the shadows, brandishing advanced tech and demanding their place in the Galactic Council. As the lead delegate, he knew he held a heavy responsibility to discern the truth about these mysterious beings. On board the resurgence, the delegates were given a taste of the hospitality and efficiency of human society. They were assigned quarters, each designed to accommodate their individual needs and comfort. The ship was alive with energy, a hive of activity with crew members carrying out their tasks with professional calm. The air buzzed with an undercurrent of anticipation and uncertainty, the crew well aware of the eyes watching their every move. 
Over the days that followed, the council delegates were given a crash course in human history, culture, and technology. They were shown the ship's advanced engine looms, vast botanical gardens that served as the ship's lungs, and the intricate network of corridors that housed a mini society of engineers, scientists, and diplomats. Diplomatic dinners were held, where human delicacies were served alongside alien cuisine, a symbol of their willingness to embrace the galactic community. Debates and discussions echoed in the dining hall, a vibrant exchange of ideas and philosophies. Despite their differences, the unspoken barriers began to crumble slowly. The delegates were privy to a glimpse of human resilience and innovation. They witnessed the collective spirit that had seen humanity rise from the ashes and carve out a new existence amongst the stars. The humans were proud of their journey, their past a testimony to their strength, their present a reflection of their adaptability, and their future a testament to their ambition. During their journey, the delegates witnessed humanity's cooperative spirit. Be it engineers working in synchrony in the engine lungs, botanists tending to the ship's green lungs, or diplomats preparing for the upcoming trial, everyone worked towards a common goal of survival, growth, and now, acceptance. Captain Varros, his curiosity piqued, found himself engaged in lengthy conversations with Ambassador Solain. From history to cultural practices, and from science to philosophy, they delved into deep discussions, often running late into the night cycle of the ship. Solane's passion for his people was palpable, his belief in their evolution and their right to stand as equals in the galactic community, unshakable. As the resurgence slipped into the FTL phase of their journey, the gravity of their mission weighed on everyone's minds. What lay ahead was unknown, but one thing was certain, the journey was going to be far more interesting than anyone could have anticipated. As the resurgence journeyed through the stars, another expedition, equally crucial, was taking place within the confines of its walls. In the depths of the ship's sprawling digital libraries, a dedicated team of historians, sociologists, scientists, and diplomats were diligently piecing together a thousand years of human evolution. They sifted through centuries of records, memories archived in crystal-clear holograms, a stark testament to humanity's unyielding will. They chronicled the struggles faced by humanity after the Galactic Council's initial judgment, the gruesome war that had decimated their home planet, the exodus that had ensued. Earth, once a vibrant planet teeming with life, had been reduced to ashes. The home of humanity had been lost, but not the spirit of humanity. Historians recounted the desperate scramble for survival, the perilous journey through the cosmos in search of a new home, a sanctuary where humanity could lick its wounds and rise from the ashes. Scientists and engineers, on the other hand, detailed the technological advancements that had made it possible to survive the cataclysm, the invention of faster-than-light travel, the development of cryogenic sleep, the engineering marvels that were their arc ships. The sociologists dived into the profound societal changes that the cataclysm had sparked. With their old world in ruins and an uncertain future looming ahead, humans had learned the hard way that their old ways would not serve them in this new era. They had to evolve, to reform their societal structures, their political systems, their very way of life. The focus shifted from rapid consumption to sustainable living, from territorial disputes to peaceful coexistence, from anarchy to a united front. The diplomats, meanwhile, were busy formulating the delivery of this evidence. The task was arguably the most challenging. How do you convince a galaxy that has seen you at your worst that you have changed for the better? They practiced their arguments, fine-tuned their speeches, and analyzed potential counter-arguments. The ambassador, Solane, was at the heart of these preparations, his calm demeanor a reassuring presence amid the whirlwind of activities. Despite the enormity of the task, there was an undercurrent of determination that permeated every deck of the resurgence. Each person, whether they were part of the preparation or not, felt the weight of the impending trial. This was their chance to rewrite their history, to prove that the phoenix of humanity had risen from the ashes stronger and wiser. They understood the importance of the trial. It wasn't just about proving their evolution to the Galactic Council, it was about proving it to themselves. They had survived the unimaginable, had rebuilt from nothing, and had dared to reach for the stars again. They were not the same species that the Galactic Council had exiled a millennium ago. They were the evolved Homo sapiens, and they were ready to show the galaxy their true worth. Simultaneously, another group was meticulously curating a collection of human achievements, a testament to their resilience and adaptability. From advanced medical breakthroughs to sustainable energy solutions, from profound philosophical discourses to vibrant cultural expressions, the evidence of human progress was profound. Artists created breathtaking holographic displays showcasing human creativity and innovation. 
musicians composed symphonies that resonated with the shared human experience of loss, struggle, hope, and triumph. They sought to convey their complex emotions, their capacity for empathy, and their insatiable thirst for knowledge and understanding traits they hoped would resonate with the diverse galactic council. Scientists and engineers had their own victories to share. Breakthroughs in medicine had increased human lifespan and quality of life, virtually eliminated disease, and made strides in understanding and modifying human genetics for the betterment of the species. The technologies for recycling and waste management, renewable energy production, and sustainable agriculture demonstrated a tangible shift from consumption to preservation. Engineers explained the ingenious designs of their cities, built in harmony with nature, and their transport systems, powered by clean energy. On the political front, a reformed governance model that emphasized democratic ideals, human rights, and social justice was outlined. The process of active reconciliation and restitution for past wrongs was highlighted, showing the Galactic Council the lengths humanity had gone to ensure fairness and justice for all. Importantly, they stressed the systems in place to prevent power abuses, the checks and balances that now define their political landscape. Among all this, the crowning jewel of their preparation was Terra Nova, the new cradle of humanity. A planet transformed by human will, Terra Nova was the embodiment of their reformed ethos. Once a barren world, it now thrived with diverse ecosystems, advanced cities, and a vibrant human population. It was the living testament to human perseverance, ingenuity, and their newfound respect for life and resources. There was a palpable tension aboard the resurgence as the crew worked tirelessly, a testament to their dedication. The preparation consumed their days and nights, the constant hum of activity a reminder of the trial that was swiftly approaching. But amidst the work and worry, there was also a sense of pride. They were not just curating evidence for their defense, they were chronicling the tale of their rebirth. Solane, watching the flurry of activity, felt a surge of admiration for his fellow humans. Each one was a living testament to their journey, their evolution. Each one carried the spark of humanity's undying spirit. As the resurgence continued its journey towards the heart of the Galactic Council, Solane realized that they had already won. Not the trial, not yet, but they had won the struggle against their past. They had become a species worthy of a second chance. The days blurred into each other as the resurgence streaked through the cosmos. The onboard rhythm of the human ship became a comforting routine for the Council delegates, the initial tension and unfamiliarity gradually giving way to mutual respect and curiosity. Each day, the Galactic Council representatives were taken through different areas of the ship, a guided tour of human resilience, creativity, and ambition. They saw the vast libraries of human knowledge, the elaborate training facilities where young aspirants learned the arts of diplomacy, science, and defense, and the recreation areas where crew members unwound, a demonstration of humanity's penchant for balance between work and leisure. They visited the central command hub, a nerve center buzzing with activity. Screens blinked with data from distant corners of the galaxy, their advanced sensors keeping an ever watchful eye on the cosmos. The humans had evolved, their systems an amalgamation of their past and their innovative present, speaking volumes about their adaptive nature. During these explorations, Captain Varros often found himself in the company of Ambassador Solane. He watched as the Ambassador navigated the ship with ease, interacting with his crew, the respect between them palpable. Solane shared their plans for future exploration, their hope for sustainable expansion, and their dream of peaceful coexistence in the galaxy. Gradually, the Galactic Council delegates began to see a different side of humanity. They were not the reckless, warlike species that the historical archives depicted. They were survivors, explorers, thinkers, builders, a race that had evolved from its violent past to reach for the stars with open minds and open hearts. Yet, doubt lingered in the minds of the Galactic Council representatives. They wondered if what they saw was merely a facade, a carefully constructed image to sway the Council in their favor. But as they interacted more with the crew, they noticed the genuine pride in their voices, the conviction in their eyes, and the hope that tinged every conversation about the future. These were not beings merely surviving, they were thriving, flourishing in the face of adversity, their spirit indomitable. In the final days of their journey, the delegates were shown the project the humans were most proud of the construction of a new habitat for their species, a planet being terraformed in the likeness of their lost Earth. It was a testament to their scientific prowess and their commitment to ensuring a sustainable existence, a tangible proof of their evolution. As the resurgence finally emerged from its FTL travel, the Galactic Council delegates were met with a sight that left them in awe. There, in the vast expanse of space, twinkled the blue-green jewel that was humanity's new home, Terra Nova. 
It shone as a beacon of hope, the symbol of a race that had defied all odds to secure a place in the cosmos. The journey to Terra Nova was a revelation for the Galactic Council delegates, especially for Captain Varos. It was a chance to glimpse the truth of humanity, to understand their struggle and their indomitable will. As they prepared to step onto the new home of humans, they were aware that the upcoming trial held more at stake than ever before. The humans had not just survived, they had evolved. Now it was up to the Galactic Council to decide whether this evolution was enough to readmit humanity into the Galactic community, to accept them as equals, and to bury the ghosts of the past once and for all. In the shadows of the colossal ship, the resurgence clung the stealth vessel. Within it, the Veritan infiltrators, armed with the galaxy's most sophisticated surveillance technology, watched the unfolding interactions with laser-like intensity. The holographic display of the ship's interior flickered with life, showing Captain Solane engaged in conversation with Captain Varos and his crew. They observed the cordiality, the professionalism, and the apparent camaraderie, but most importantly, they perceived the mutual respect. An uncomfortable truth was surfacing. The humans had changed. They weren't the havoc creakers of a thousand years ago, but a seemingly organized, civilized race capable of diplomacy. It was a reality that conflicted with the Veritan narrative of a monstrous humanity, and it planted the seeds of doubt in one of the infiltrators, Kren. As the resurgence hurtled out of FTL, the infiltrator's gaze shifted to the site that greeted them. A glittering jewel of technology and civilization shone against the backdrop of the dark void. New Terra. It was mesmerizing and terrifying at the same time. Away from the bustling corridors and busy control decks, Ambassador Solane retreated into the sanctuary of his quarters. The room was modestly adorned, bearing only a few personal effects. A hint of the man beneath the diplomat. His gaze fell upon a nondescript drawer in his desk, its contents known only to him. Hands shaking slightly, Solane reached for the drawer, pulling out an old, worn device. A relic from a time best left forgotten, a witness to humanity's darkest hour, delicately unwrapping the tiny device from the folds of an ancient, time-worn cloth. As the resurgence hummed around him, he felt the weight of his solitude. His quarters were a haven away from the frantic pace of the bridge, a place where he could steep himself in the memories of his ancestors, where he could touch history. As the device activated, a flurry of holographic screens sprang up, each displaying a date and a log entry. The entry spanned over six long months of fear, hope, desperation, and, ultimately, survival. They were the chronicles of a starship captain from a time when humanity was fleeing for its very existence from the Galactic Council. His ancestor, Captain Jason Roller, he pressed play. The captain's voice filled the room, and the words pierced through the veil of centuries, resonating with a chilling clarity. Solane listened, his heart pounding, as the logs unveiled the turbulent saga of humanity's fight for survival. Captain's Log, Stardate 7385.2 Proclamation Day The Galactic Council has sentenced us to eradication. The Viratans have been sent to enforce it. We received the distress call from Terra. It's time to run, time to hide. The cryosleep chambers are filled to the brim. Families torn apart, lives uprooted, an entire species on the break. The mood is somber, desperate. We push the engines to their limit, our course random, our destination unknown. His throat choked up as he listened to the fear-laced account of the first days. The terror, the uncertainty, the desperate hope, it was all too real, a chilling reminder of the atrocities they faced. Captain's Log, Stardate 7391.9 We've had our first encounter with a Veritan patrol. Their ships blotted out the stars, their weapons lighting up the darkness. Our defense is held, for now. The enemy's face is etched in our nightmares. We've barely made it out of the soul system and the Veritans are already breathing down our necks. Captain's Log, Stardate 7402.3 We are no longer alone. More human vessels have joined our flight. Together we're a ragtag fleet, refugees bound by our species and our desperate struggle for survival. We've had to fight more times than I care to count. Each victory is pyrrhic, each defeat devastating. Yet, amidst the chaos, there is a glimmer of hope, of unity. We stand together, we fight together, and in this shared struggle, we find our strength. As the entries progressed, they documented the relentless pursuit of the Veritans, their ruthless attempts at extermination. Space battles painted the cosmos with fire, but humanity fought on, fleeing, surviving. The entries spoke of narrow escapes, of allies lost, of newfound friends in distant star systems, and of secrets whispered by nebulas and star clusters.
The entries painted a vivid picture of their relentless struggle against time and destiny as the humans raced against the clock, seeking refuge in the farthest corners of the galaxy. Each date marked a moment in history, a testament to humanity's tenacity. The last entry, made six months after the first, documented their arrival at a habitable world far removed from their previous existence. A world where humanity could start anew, unseen, unheard, and out of the reach of the Galactic Council. The captain's voice, strained but triumphant, echoed in Solane's mind, We have found home. The log ended, the voice faded, leaving behind a poignant silence. The narrative woven by Captain Roller was a chilling reminder of humanity's past, a stark testament to their will to survive, and a beacon for their future. Solane rivetly put the device away, each entry leaving an imprint on his soul. His gaze turned to a small, simple picture frame resting on the desk. It was an old photograph, faded and worn with age, showing a man in a worn uniform standing beside a starship, a look of defiance etched in his features. The nameplate on his chest read Captain Jason Roller. Roller was his forefather, the valiant captain of the starship from the logs, and Solane's direct ancestor. His heart swelled with a mixture of pride and sorrow as he traced his fingers over the photograph. This was his lineage, his legacy. This fight for reintegration was not just political, it was deeply personal. Yet beneath this honor and legacy, there stirred a darker ambition within Solane. Humanity would not merely return as a meek and subservient member. They would return as equals, perhaps even more. They would rise from the ashes of their past, their strength and resolve shining brighter than ever. As he looked out at the vast expanse of stars, his mind filled with dreams of a future where humanity would finally reclaim its rightful place among the stars, no longer as fugitives or refugees, but as the respected and powerful entity they had grown to become. And perhaps, just perhaps, they might even come to dominate the Council, the galaxy, and their destiny. The starship resurgence hung gently in the quiet depths of space, her hull bathed in the soft azure glow of New Terra's sun. A light beep echoed in Solane's quarters, pulling him from his contemplation. A message flashed on his screen, delegation ready for departure in Shell Bay 3. He took a moment to collect himself before leaving the solitude of his quarters. The stories of his ancestor, the echoes of a past stained by war and the painful memories it evoked, were now locked away once more. He had to focus on the present, on the delicate task of convincing the Galactic Council of Humanity's transformation. As Solane entered the shuttle bay, the grandeur of human engineering loomed before him. Sleek, silver shuttles lay cradled in their docks, humming with anticipation. A stark contrast to the ones he'd seen in Captain Atherton's logs, these represented a beacon of hope, progress, and determination. Captain Varros and his fellow delegates stood by the chosen vessel, a state-of-the-art shuttle named Phoenix. Its design was a testament to humanity's survival and resilience. Solane felt a sense of pride swell within him as he approached the delegates. He greeted the delegates with a courteous nod. Their faces were a mix of apprehension and curiosity. Welcome to Phoenix, he began, guiding them into the shuttle. Its interior was well lit, the seats were comfortable and utilitarian, and a viewport stretched across one side of the shuttle, offering an unhindered view of the cosmos beyond. As the shuttle detached from the resurgence and began its descent, the view took everyone's breath away. Aboard their advanced stealth ship, Kryn and Ya had remained silent observers. Hidden in plain sight, they witnessed the shuttle's departure toward the planet, a sight that was both awe-inspiring and terrifying. As the shuttle grew smaller and finally disappeared into the atmosphere of New Terra, Kryn broke the silence. This isn't what we were told, he said, his voice hoarse with unease. Yeah, his focus fixed on their console, nodded. The Council underestimated them. Their progress, it's far beyond what we could have imagined. A silence fell between them again as they considered the magnitude of their mission. But they had orders, and neither dared to voice their growing doubts. We have to proceed, Kren finally said, more to convince himself than you. It's time. New Terra, their haven for a thousand years, came into sight. The planet was a stunning sight, swirling clouds over verdant landmasses interspersed with glimmering bodies of water. The orbital stations, spacecraft, and satellites they passed on their journey down were proof of human advancement. The delegates, especially Varos, were visibly taken aback. Their eyes flitted between the planet growing steadily larger in the viewport and the advanced console displays that filled the cockpit. The aura in the shuttle shifted, no longer an air of apprehension but one of awestruck wonder. Solene could only imagine what they must be thinking as they took in the marvels of human progress. They began to converse amongst themselves in hushed tones, occasionally throwing glances Solane's way. 
He welcomed their curiosity, answering questions about the technology and infrastructure they were witnessing. The realization seemed to dawn on all present in the shuttle that humans were no longer the primitive, resource-guzzling species they had been a millennium ago. They were not just survivors, they were innovators and peacemakers. And they were powerful. Powerful enough to challenge the balance of the Galactic Council if they so wished. This unspoken revelation hung in the air, adding a gravity to the remainder of the journey. Solane allowed the delegates a moment to process this new reality as they drew closer to the surface of new terror. This was just the beginning, he mused. Wait till they see what we've done on the ground. The descent into New Terra's atmosphere was smooth, thanks to the advanced stabilizers of the Phoenix. As they pierced through the clouds, the panorama of New Terra unfolded before them. It was a harmony of technology and nature. Vast green expanses ran adjacent to sprawling metropolises. High-speed rail systems weaved their way like silver serpents across the landscape. Hovering vehicles darted between towering structures, all under the watchful eye of colossal drones maintaining order. I present to you, New Terra, the heart of human civilization, Solane announced. His voice echoed through the shuttle, his words hanging in the air as the delegates soaked in the spectacle. Varros, leaning forward in his seat, surveyed the land. His eyes, wide with curiosity, darted over the myriad of activities on the planet's surface, an alien world shaped by human hands. He turned to Solane, his voice betraying his astonishment. This is not what I expected. You've advanced further than we could have imagined. Solane nodded, a lot can happen in a thousand years, Captain. They continued their journey towards the capital city of Arcadia, a beacon of human achievement. Its silhouette, dominated by towering structures, shimmered in the horizon, a testament to humanity's ingenuity. They navigated through the city's air traffic, which was flawlessly organized by advanced AI systems. As they approached the heart of the city, the Phoenix descended towards a landing platform atop a magnificent skyscraper. The delegates were escorted through a grand lobby, its walls adorned with holographic displays recounting a thousand years of human history and triumphs. Walking through Arcadia, the delegates were further confronted with humanity's progress. Monolithic structures of steel and glass reached for the skies, while lush gardens and parks wove their way through the urban sprawl, a reminder of humanity's newfound respect for nature. The city buzzed with energy and innovation, from the autonomous transport systems to the swarm of drones fulfilling various tasks. Humanity's rebirth was apparent in every aspect of Arcadian life. The city was filled with humans and AI living harmoniously, their interactions smooth and natural. In every district, engineers, scientists, artists, and civilians moved with purpose, their expressions reflecting contentment and determination. Holographic screens displayed news, entertainment, and scholarly debates, demonstrating a society that valued knowledge, creativity, and progress. The visit was an immersive crash course in human culture. Delegates watched as children learned in advanced learning centers, holographic teachers providing individualized education. They witnessed debates in assembly halls where citizens discussed societal issues, decisions reached through consensus and aided by AI analytics. They marveled at hospitals where medical AI and human doctors worked side by side, healing and innovating. Aboard their advanced stealth ship, Command, we have arrived at the human homeworld. Their progress, it's far beyond our estimates. They have a formidable fleet, advanced infrastructure. We might be underprepared. The icy voice that responded did nothing to quell his growing unease. Maintain the mission, proceed with caution, and plan your next steps. We count on you. As the link severed, Kren and his companion, Ya, turned their attention back to the resurgence. Slowly and carefully, they maneuvered their stealth craft, moving closer to the massive hulk of the resurgence. They found an out-of-the-way recess on the underbelly of the ship, a location that wouldn't draw any attention. It was there they decided to place the explosive device. The Veriton device was a masterpiece of engineering's compact, powerful, and almost impossible to detect once installed. With precision, they attached the bomb to the resurgence's hull, their hearts heavy with the gravity of their actions. They were not assassins, but soldiers following orders. Still, the thought of what would happen if their device was detonated was chilling. As they retreated, the small bomb sat ominously against the metallic gray hull of the resurgence, a silent and deadly reminder of the tenuous peace. Their mission complete, Kran and Yu retreated, the stealth craft once again blending into the dark expanse of space. As they put distance between themselves and the resurgence, the weight of their actions settled on them. They had effectively planted a sword of Damocles over the humans' heads, a single detonation away from disaster. 
Back on the Veritan flagship, their leader received the confirmation message. The mission was complete. The contingency was in place. A simple push of a button, and humanity's dreams would be reduced to cosmic dust. The sun was setting over New Terra when an ear-piercing alarm tore through the peace, echoing across the sprawling capital. Squads of soldiers in high-tech armor mobilized, taking strategic positions as buildings were swiftly locked down. Automated defense systems hummed to life, creating a seamless shield around the city. In the skies above, fleets of advanced fighters and shuttles roared to life, lifting off and forming an intricate dance of air superiority. The fleet of majestic battleships in orbit started to reposition themselves, their gleaming hulls reflecting the setting sun as they encircled Terra Nova in a formidable wall of steel and energy. In the midst of this calculated chaos, Ambassador Solane quickly ushered the startled council delegates into a fortified bunker. The normally peaceful faces of the Galactic Council members were replaced by expressions of confusion and fear as they were hastily led to a secure briefing room. Before anyone could voice their questions, Solane stepped forward, his eyes hardened, an anomaly has been detected, he began, the room falling silent. Our outposts detected a transmission that doesn't correspond with any human frequency. We couldn't interrupt it, but we have its origin, and we're closing in. Back in the cold void of space, the crew of the Veritan Infiltrator felt a shiver run through them. Their stealth craft, a pinnacle of Veritan technology, was suddenly feeling exposed. Their hollow displays, usually calm with the blue of their stealth mode, flickered with alerts. The humans were looking for them. Out in the blackness, swarms of human military craft maneuvered with practiced ease. They spread out, their sensors running continuous scans, building a three-dimensional map of every nook and corner of the resurgence. The infiltrator's cockpit was tense, the silence only broken by the beeping of their control panels. Kryn was biting his lower lip, his eyes darting between the hollow displays. The humans weren't supposed to detect them, yet here they were, their vessels swarming the resurgence, their sensors sweeping with intent. Yours clawed fingers danced on the control panel as he switched the craft to minimal power mode. The onboard systems fell silent, their hollow displays dimming to a faint glow. Their life support and gravity systems were the only active systems, everything else lay dormant in a desperate bid to avoid detection. But their hope was short-lived. A shadow fell over the infiltrator as a larger human vessel appeared, its silhouette ominously looming in the reflected sunlight of New Terra. Before the Veritans could react, the vessel fired a light pulsar cannon, a brilliant blue beam glancing out and hitting the infiltrator. Their systems blinked out, the ship dead in space. A moment of terrifying silence was abruptly shattered by the magnetic grapple of the human ship, latching onto the inert infiltrator and dragging it into the cargo bay of the resurgence. The stealthy hunters had become the hunted, their fate now resting in the hands of the humans they so despised. Down on New Terra, in the high-tech briefing room, hollow displays flickered with information and telemetry data. Solane's voice echoed in the chamber, narrating the unexpected situation. The council delegates watched, their eyes glued to the real-time feed of the human vessel capturing the infiltrator. Consider this an informal extension of our case before the Galactic Council, Solane said, a subtle fire in his eyes. This is the proof of humanity's resilience and our commitment to peace. A murmur ran through the delegation, their eyes glued to the holographic image of the infiltrator being brought into the resurgence's cargo bay. It was an image that would be hard to forget. Outside the window of the briefing room, the sky had now darkened completely, the stars shining down on new Terra. It was as though the heavens themselves were watching the unfolding drama, silent witnesses to humanity's strength. Inside the inert Veritan infiltrator, Kryn and Yorv could only sit helplessly as their ship was dragged into the resurgence. Their eyes flickered in the low emergency lighting, reflecting the stark reality of their situation. Their mission was supposed to be invisible, undetectable. Yet, here they were, their stealth technology proving ineffective against human ingenuity. The cargo bay doors of the resurgence closed, the infiltrator clamped onto the deck by magnetic locks. From a distant control room, human technicians and security personnel watched the captured craft. Their faces hardened as they began to plan their next move. Once in the secure hangar, the infiltrator was quickly surrounded by armored soldiers. Their guns pointed at the small craft, the red laser sights crisscrossing over the hatch. An eerie silence descended on the scene, the soldiers ready for any sudden movement from inside the infiltrator. In the control room, a woman in a crisp uniform, adorned with several commendation ribbons, gave the order. Deploy the isolation field. Let's make sure our guests don't have any more surprises for us. At her command, an energy field was activated, encasing the Veritan infiltrator in a soft blue glow. 
Any attempt to send a distress call or activate any explosive device would be effectively neutralized. It was yet another testament to human technology and their readiness for potential threats. Inside the infiltrator, Kryn and Yorv could only watch as the energy field enveloped them, their options dwindling. You stared at the bomb controls, now useless inside the energy field. The humans. He began, his voice barely above a whisper, they're not the same species anymore. Kryn nodded, his gaze fixed on the armored soldiers outside. They've grown, stronger, smarter. We've underestimated them. His voice was laced with a hint of regret, a sentiment echoed by the quiet, desolate ambience inside the infiltrator. Back in the briefing room, Solane turned to the council delegates. And this, esteemed delegates, is humanity. We fight not out of a lust for war, but a yearning for peace. We did not seek out the Veritans. They came to us. They sought to strike at us from the shadows. Yet, here we are, stronger than ever. His gaze swept over the council members, his voice firm and proud. Whatever happens next, know this, we are ready. The question is, are you? As the final words hung in the room, the silence was palpable. The delegates exchanged glances, the gravity of the situation sinking in. The image of the captured infiltrator, now a symbol of humanity's determination and strength, was etched in their minds. In the bustling command center of New Terra, a hush fell over the room as a Veritan infiltrator ship, a sleek predator in a sea of human vessels, was dragged into the resurgence's cargo bay. The heightened sense of alertness was palpable, as though the air itself had grown thick with tension. At the center of this whirlwind stood Ambassador Solane, a formidable figure with the weight of his people's history on his shoulders. He was joined by Captain Varos, a Veritan who had dared to bridge the chasm between their two species and was now witnessing the consequences of past mistrust. Captain Varos began Solane, his voice cutting through the tense silence. Do you recognize this ship? Varos, watching the live feed from the resurgence, nodded. It's a Veritan infiltrator. State-of-the-art stealth tech. This is unexpected. A moment of uneasy silence passed between them before Solane pressed on. I understand that you might not know how this ship ended up here, or why, but we need your help to resolve this situation peacefully. Veros's gaze was hard, his expression one of determination. I had no idea that such a ship was en route to your world, Ambassador. I assure you, I will help however I can. Before more could be said, a report came in from the Resurgence's engineering team. We found something, sir, a voice rang out from the comms panel, it's, it's a bomb, attached to the hull of the resurgence. Shock swept through the room, and all eyes turned to Varos. Solane's gaze was steely as he turned to the Veritan captain. We extended a hand in friendship, captain. Is this your people's response? Varos looked as though he'd been struck. I, I don't know, ambassador. This is not how we operate, not anymore. As accusations hung in the air, the infiltrator's crew were escorted from their ship in shackles, their eyes wide with fear. Their fate, for now, was to be held in the resurgence's brig, but the looming question of their ultimate punishment hung heavy in the room. Varos, clearly shaken, made a request to the command. I need to speak with my people, Ambassador Solane. With the council. I must assure them that this is not our doing, that we had no part in this. Solane, after a brief moment, gave a curt nod. Granted, Captain Varos, but we have much to discuss. Your delegation, they're still our guests, but circumstances have changed. With that, Varos took his leave, his mind whirling with the gravity of the situation. His people were on the brink of a major diplomatic crisis, and he felt the burden of responsibility resting on his shoulders. He had to make things right, for the sake of both their races. Meanwhile, the Human Command, in light of the discovery of the bomb, decided to hold an urgent meeting to discuss their course of action. The revelation of the Veritan ship and its crew had drastically changed the dynamics of the already delicate situation. Despite the heightened security measures, the day-to-day -day activities on New Terra carried on. Civilians went about their business, largely oblivious to the machinations and tensions brewing among their leaders. For them, it was another day of peace and prosperity on their beautiful world. But for Solane, Varos, and the rest of the command, it was a stark reminder of the fragility of peace and the ever-present shadow of their past. Inside the resurgence's secure meeting room, human officials were huddled together, debating their next course of action. The discovery of the bomb and the Veritan infiltrators had sent shockwaves through the command structure. The room was a simmering pot of murmured discussions and tense glances. The atmosphere was thick with apprehension, 
At the head of the table sat Admiral Zalima Ross, a stern, sharp-featured woman with salt and pepper hair. Her fierce gaze swept over the room, silencing the murmurs. We are here not to place blame, but to find solutions, she said, her voice commanding the room. We need to handle this situation with diplomacy and tact. Before the meeting could proceed further, the doors hissed open to admit Ambassador Solane. His gaze, hardened by the events of the day, swept over the officials before he spoke. Any development on the infiltrators or the bomb? Engineer Dale Marks stood up to provide an update. The bomb has been safely disarmed and moved to a secure location, Ambassador, he began, as for the infiltrators, they're refusing to cooperate. We're having trouble extracting any useful information. Solane nodded thoughtfully, processing the information. I suggest we request Captain Varos's assistance. Despite the circumstances, he is their kin and might be able to get them to talk. Just as the discussions were about to take a new turn, a nervous ensign rushed into the room. Ambassador Solane, urgent message from Captain Varos, he managed between gasps of air. The entire room fell silent, every eye fixed on Solane. He accepted the message device from the ensign and read the contents aloud. My sincerest apologies for the distress caused. I have reached out to my superiors in the Galactic Council and they have decided to intervene. The room buzzed with speculative whispers at the sudden announcement. But what could this intervention mean? Could it bring peace or incite more chaos? In the light of recent events, Solane continued, the Council has decided to accelerate the diplomatic process. They propose a meeting between all major parties involved at a neutral location in the Targan system. The announcement hung in the air like an echo, and the room fell silent. A meeting with the Galactic Council had not been on the agenda, not this soon. The implications of this accelerated diplomacy were significant. Admiral Ross was the first to break the silence. This is an unexpected turn of events. But we must use this opportunity to our advantage. We will be able to present our case and demand justice. There's more, Solane interjected, his gaze grave. We'll need to leave immediately. The Targan system is six days away on our fastest ships. We need to make preparations and depart. His words sent a ripple of urgency through the room. Engineers were called, ships were prepared, and plans for the long journey and crucial meeting were laid out. Amidst this flurry of activity, Captain Varros was brought in to speak with the detained Veritans. They were holed up in a high-security containment cell, their faces set in stony, defiant expressions. The air inside the room was thick with tension as Varros began to speak, his voice steady yet imbued with a sense of urgency. He learned that these Veritans were from a radical faction that believed in the Veritan superiority and were against any form of peace or cooperation with other races. They believed that the Galactic Council was an impediment to the Veritan ascendance to galactic domination. They were staunch, unyielding, and steeped in their convictions. Their fanaticism, while disturbing, provided valuable insights into the political dynamics within the Veritan society. It became clear that while the Galactic Council was dealing with representatives like Varos, who promoted peace and diplomacy, there was an undercurrent of radical beliefs that threatened this peace. This new knowledge was relayed to the ambassador and the human officials. It gave them a better understanding of what they were dealing with, and they adjusted their strategies for the upcoming meeting accordingly. Three of humanity's most formidable ships were prepped for departure, the Resurgence, the Endeavor, and the Vengeance. Their gleaming hulls stood a testament to human resilience and engineering prowess. They were not just mere spaceships, they were symbols of humanity's triumphant return to the galactic stage. Ambassador Solane, Admiral Ross, and a team of chosen delegates prepared to embark on their journey to the Targan system. Plans were laid, contingencies were mapped, and every possible scenario was considered and reconsidered. They were not just heading towards a diplomatic meeting, they were heading towards a new destiny. In the light of the setting sun, the three mighty ships took off, their engines roaring as they tore through the atmosphere, leaving behind streaks of fire against the twilight sky. The journey had begun. As the three ships cut through the fabric of space, inside the resurgence, the mood was a mix of grim determination and cautious hope. The meeting with the Galactic Council was of utmost importance, and each member of the delegation had a role to play in shaping humanity's future. Solane, Ross, and the others immersed themselves in briefing documents and strategic plans, trying to anticipate every possible outcome of the meeting. From peaceful negotiations to outright hostility, they prepared for every scenario. At the heart of their strategy was the evidence of the Veritan fanatics' actions, proof of their aggression that humanity had managed to thwart. While the delegation prepared, the rest of the crew kept the ship running smoothly. 
The resurgence, designed to be a symbol of humanity's resurgence among the stars, was filled with the best and brightest humanity had to offer. Every person on board knew the gravity of their mission. They were not just carrying their representatives to a meeting, they were carrying the hopes and aspirations of all humans. In parallel, Captain Varos had been spending most of his time in deep conversation with the detained Veritans, trying to reason with them and extract as much information as possible. The more he learned, the clearer it became that the fanatical faction within his people was more dangerous than he'd anticipated. Their plans, their zealous beliefs, it was all a twisted perversion of the Veritan ethos he held dear. As the days passed, the Targan system grew closer, the stars ahead of them shifting, adjusting their configurations as the human fleet continued its relentless advance. For those aboard, each passing moment was heavy with the weight of anticipation, tinged with the unknown. On the sixth day, as the Targan system star began to fill their view, Solane stood before the viewport in his quarters, lost in thought. He reflected on the journey they had undertaken, the challenges they had faced, and the momentous meeting that lay ahead. As he watched the far-off sun grow ever larger, his calm device chimed. It was Admiral Ross. Ambassador, we're approaching the designated coordinates. The Galactic Council's ship is already waiting for us. Solane nodded, his gaze still on the distant star. Thank you, Admiral, he said, his voice steady. He took one last look at the radiant star of the Targon system before turning away. Let's not keep them waiting. With those words, he left his quarters, making his way towards the meeting room. This was it. The moment of truth. As the doors of the meeting room slid open before him, he stepped in, ready to face the challenges that awaited. Outside, as the three human ships slowed their approach, a massive, intricate spacecraft bearing the insignia of the Galactic Council revealed itself. It was a sight to behold, a testament to the grandeur of galactic civilization. The Targan system, an unsuspecting backdrop to this grand diplomatic play, watched silently as humanity, in its gleaming armada, advanced towards an uncertain future, the echoes of their past carried in their wake. The journey was far from over. As the ships came to a halt, a sense of trepidation swept through the crew. The next few hours could decide the fate of humanity among the stars. The time had come to meet the Galactic Council. The stage was set. The curtain was about to rise. While the resurgence was on its way to the Targon system to meet with the Galactic Council, back on New Terra, the military was hard at work. The captured Veritan infiltrator ship had become a center of tireless activity, the subject of rigorous analysis and scrutiny. Its advanced stealth technology, which had defied New Terra's formidable defenses, was an engineering marvel that promised profound insights. Simultaneously, within a secured military installation, an elite team of forensic technologists were diligently working on the ship's quantum computer. The complexity of Veritan encryption protocols was daunting, but not insurmountable. The team managed to crack into the system and initiated the process of downloading and decoding the ship's data logs. After countless hours of relentless analysis, the team unearthed a disturbing revelation. The bombing attempt on New Terra had been the brainchild of a group of high-ranking Veritan officers. The absence of Captain Varro's name in the plan validated their previous suspicions of his innocence. The discovery sent a ripple through the military command. They had severely underestimated the Veritans' audacious strategies. Retaliation was in order, but it had to be carried out with a blend of stealth and finesse, along with a dose of the Veritans' own medicine. Guided by General Henson, New Terra's military top brass commenced planning a subtle counterstrike. They decided to deliver the bomb, still in working condition, to the Veritan officer with the highest rank who was part of the plot. To carry out this mission, they would employ the very same stealth ship, symbolically using the Veritan's own weapon against them. Their objective was to stage the assassination as an accident, a tragic consequence of their own vile plot. The message was unequivocal, humanity was not a species to be trifled with. They could play the same perilous game with equivalent, if not superior, guile and audacity. Ambassador Solane, despite his diplomatic role on the resurgence, was privy to this counter-operation. As the negotiations neared, he understood the delicate balance he needed to maintain, navigating the diplomatic minefield while silently assisting the retribution on the Veritans. As the final preparations were put in place, the counter-strike commenced. A solitary stealth ship embarked on its journey into the abyss of space, veering towards Veritan territory. The resurgence, drawing ever closer to the Targon system, was oblivious to the drama unfolding back home. In this grand game of interstellar chess, humanity had just made its next move, a subtle blend of diplomacy and requital. 
Back on the resurgence, inside the council chamber, the room thrummed with tension as Ambassador Solane took center stage. The ambient noise of the Galactic Council members' discussions dissipated as Solane began to speak. His voice carried through the vast hall, resounding with unwavering determination. Members of the Galactic Council, he started, his gaze sweeping across the chamber. We are here to make amends for the past and to lay the groundwork for a future where humanity can coexist in harmony with our Galactic Brethren. The room fell silent and Solane took a breath before continuing. We ask for the revocation of the extermination decree and the recognition of our sovereignty. We wish to be treated as equals in this galactic community. His words echoed throughout the chamber. The council members exchanged glances, their faces hard to read. But Solane did not waver. He proceeded to the next point on their agenda. He gestured toward Varos, who stood by his side. We've recently thwarted an attempt by Veritan fanatics to bomb our flagship. Captain Varos, an honorable Veritan, helped us in this effort, solidifying the fact that there are factions within the Veritans who do not agree with this order of extermination. We hold proof of this plot, proof of a crime against the Galactic Council's laws. Gasps of surprise echoed around the chamber, faces turned toward Varos who nodded solemnly in confirmation. A wave of murmurs broke out across the chamber. The revelation had clearly made an impact. With their attention firmly on the human delegation, Solane decided to seize the moment. We have not been idle during our exile, he said. Humanity has made strides in technological and military advancements. A holographic display lit up the room, showcasing a new class of ship designed by humanity. Its sleek design and advanced propulsion system were testament to humanity's determination to progress, a testament to their resilience. The council members watched in stunned silence as the blueprints of a ship unlike any in their current arsenal rotated slowly in the display. We offer this as a demonstration of our capability and our potential, Solane stated, we're not the same species that was driven into exile. We're prepared to defend ourselves if necessary, but our hope is for peace. The chamber buzzed with whispers, the display causing a stir among the council members. For the first time in a millennia, they were seeing humanity not as a threat, but as a potential ally, a force to be reckoned with. Finally, Solane motioned towards the detained Veritan fanatics. We are handing over these Veritans to the Galactic Council for a fair trial, as per the Galactic Laws, he said. This act served as a goodwill gesture, showing that humanity was ready to adhere to the laws that governed the galactic civilization. Counselor Tessara took a moment to absorb everything before finally speaking. We appreciate your openness, Ambassador Solane. The Council will take all of this into consideration. We will also lift the extermination decree with immediate effect. A wave of relief washed over Solane at her words, but he knew their task was far from over. As a final request, he said, we wish to rejoin the galactic community without having to face a trial for humanity's past actions. We propose this matter be put to a vote. There was a long silence as Tessara considered his proposal. Finally, she nodded. Very well, Ambassador Solane. We will put the matter to a vote. As the council chamber filled with heated discussions about the impending vote, the human delegation retreated. They had done all they could. Now, they could only wait for the Council's decision. Back on the resurgence, news of the Council's decision to lift the extermination order spread like wildfire. The ship, a symbol of human resilience and determination, reverberated with the triumphant cheers of the crew. Yet, despite this small victory, there was an undercurrent of tension. Their fate was not yet fully decided. Admiral Ross, on hearing the news, took a moment to let the gravity of the situation sink in. They had survived, they had grown, and now, they had taken their first step towards reclaiming their place among the stars. But the journey was far from over. He rallied his senior officers, informing them of the situation. We've come a long way, he said, his voice echoing throughout the room, but our fight for acceptance in the galactic community has only just begun. Simultaneously, Ambassador Solane, Captain Varros, and the rest of the human delegation returned to their ship. As they exited the council chamber, they could still hear the heated debates of the council members. The impending vote hung heavy on their minds. Solane, although relieved at the lifting of the extermination decree, was acutely aware of the monumental task that lay ahead. He joined Admiral Ross in the main communications room, where the tension was palpable. The Galactic Council will soon vote on our reinstatement, Solane announced, his voice steady. We've done our part. We've showcased our growth, our capabilities, and our commitment to galactic law. Now, all we can do is wait. Captain Varros, standing beside Solane, nodded in agreement. 
You've made a strong case, he admitted, and shown considerable courage. No matter the outcome, humanity has already earned my respect. The Admiral nodded his appreciation at Varro's. Thank you, Captain. Regardless of the results, we have already achieved more than we could have hoped for. But, let's hope the Council sees us for what we have become. The Galactic Council's deliberations seemed to stretch for an eternity. Each passing moment brought a new wave of anticipation and anxiety. The entire human delegation, their crew, and all of humanity back on New Terra waited with bated breath, their future hanging in the balance. Hours passed, turning into a day, and then two. The third day dawned with a message from the Galactic Council, marked with the official seal. Admiral Ross, with Solane and Varros at his side, opened the communication. Counselor Tessara's holographic image materialized before them. Admiral Ross, Ambassador Solane, Captain Varros, she initiated, her voice reverberating through the tense silence of the room. The Galactic Council has deliberated on the matter of human reintegration into the Galactic community. We have put it to a vote. An overwhelming silence ensued, a moment so still it seemed as if every breath, every heartbeat was held captive. The three men exchanged looks of anticipation, their fate and the fate of their species pressing upon their shoulders. This was the critical juncture, their future amongst the stars hanging on the counselor's forthcoming words. As the tension escalated, Tessara's voice sliced through the quiet, solid and unwavering. The council's verdict, she paused for effect, allowing anticipation to fester, is unanimous. There is no need for a retrial. Humanity has demonstrated its evolution, its growth. Her words resonated in the chamber, brimming with profound implications. There would be no retrial, their future was now secure. They had not only bought time, but also earned acceptance. Their struggle for survival had brought forth a new dawn, where the shadow of extermination no longer loomed. The holographic image of Counselor Tessara faded away, leaving behind a profound silence, not of shock, but of acceptance mixed with exultation. The news sparked an electrifying surge of relief, rapidly transforming into renewed determination. Back on New Terra, news of the Galactic Council's verdict swept across the planet. The collective sigh of relief from humanity was tangible, a mass exhalation for the freedom they had won. It was quickly followed by a surge of pride and resolve. They had proven their worth, now they would continue to grow and excel. President Lyra Wren addressed her people in a globally broadcasted speech, her voice resolute and inspiring. We have successfully evaded the shadow of extermination, she declared. The Galactic Council has seen our evolution, our growth, and has welcomed us into their fold. It's time to show them the true potential of humanity. Her proclamation ignited a flame in the hearts of all humans. They had a purpose, a mission. Schools, universities, research labs, political offices, all sectors of human society thrummed with renewed vigor. Historical accomplishments were celebrated, scientific advancements showcased, all in the spirit of embodying the peaceful and advanced civilization they were recognized to be. On board the resurgence, an air of joyous relief and strong determination prevailed. They had averted a disaster and secured a promising future. Admiral Ross addressed his crew, his voice resonating through the ship's communication system. We've earned more than a reprieve, we've earned our place. Let's continue our journey among the stars with dignity and perseverance. The journey back to New Terra was a testament to human resilience. The sight that welcomed the resurgence on touchdown was one of unity and resolve. Every individual of the human race stood ready, ready to prove their worth, to show the Galactic Council and the universe that they had truly evolved. Their journey had just begun, and one thing was clear, they were moving forward with strength. They had earned their place among the stars, and they were ready for the challenges and opportunities that came with it. Humanity was prepared for its new role in the Galactic Council. Hello there, it's just a quick pause before we dive back into the exciting world of The Last Humans. If you've been on this journey with me from the start, I want to take a moment to express my gratitude for your engagement and support. Your interest in the story fuels my creativity and makes this all the more rewarding. If you're new to the story or haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel. Your support helps me keep the story going and enables me to bring you more exciting narratives from the farthest corners of the universe. I deeply appreciate each and every one of you. Without you, this venture wouldn't be half as fulfilling as it is. Now, enough of this brief intermission. Let's get back to our story, to a world beyond the stars, back to the last humans. The moment the Galactic Council's proclamation reached New Terra, the atmosphere transformed. Joyous cries filled the air as people poured out into the streets, their faces alight with jubilation. 
After 1,000 years of struggle, humanity was finally being recognized as an equal in the grand scheme of the galaxy. It wasn't just New Terra, every human colonized world echoed with celebration. For an entire week, the humans reveled in their victory, their collective joy resonating across light years of space. Amidst the festivities, an official communication arrived from the Galactic Council. The Council extended a formal invitation to humanity to join its ranks in a ceremony to be held on Zeta Prime in 15 soul rotations. The invitation, a holographic scroll inscribed with elaborate alien scripts and symbols, was a testament to the grandeur of the occasion. While the celebrations raged on, plans for the journey to Zeta Prime and the impending ceremony were already underway. The Resurgence, the flagship of humanity's fleet, was chosen for the journey, symbolizing the resilience and determination of mankind. In the heart of New Terra, at the main hangar of the Planetary Defense Force, the Resurgence stood tall and proud, gleaming under the artificial lights. The ship was a testament to human ingenuity, a symbol of their capability and potential. As engineers worked round the clock to ensure it was in optimal condition, the resurgence was more than a spaceship, it was a beacon of hope, a testament to human resilience and what could be achieved. Ambassador Solane, Admiral Ross, were selected to represent humanity at the ceremony and Captain Varros, now the ambassador to New Terra accompanied the humans. While they had been at the forefront of humanity's efforts to regain their place among the stars, this was a responsibility that carried a unique weight. They were not just representing themselves or their professions, they were representing an entire species. In preparation for their journey and the ceremony, the Solane and Ross immersed themselves in diplomatic protocols, learning about the cultures and customs of hundreds of alien civilizations. Language lessons, etiquette training, historical briefings, their schedules were packed. Yet, the importance of their mission kept them motivated. Ambassador Varro was also able to give his unique perspective and insight into the various council members. As the day of departure drew near, a palpable sense of anticipation filled the air. The preparations for the journey were rigorous, involving not just the technical readiness of the ship, but also strategizing for possible challenges. Despite the promise of acceptance and unity, the threat of the Veritan still loomed. Plans were devised, contingencies prepared, and when Captain Davies and his team of skilled soldiers boarded the resurgence, they knew they carried the weight of humanity's future. On the day of departure, the resurgence stood ready. Its engines hummed with raw power, and its hull shone with the reflected glory of a triumphant civilization. As Ambassador Solane, Admiral Ross, and Ambassador Varros boarded the ship, they looked back at the throngs of cheering humans. This wasn't just a voyage for them, it was a journey for all of humanity. With its engines roaring to life, the resurgence lifted off, soaring towards the stars. The journey to Zeta Prime had begun, marking a new chapter in human history. As the ship disappeared into the inky void, the people of New Terra looked up, their hearts filled with hope and their spirits soaring with their representatives. A new era was dawning, an era where humanity was no longer an outcast, but a member of the Galactic Council. The journey was far from over, but the destination seemed within reach, a point of light in the vast expanse of the universe. On board the Veritan Infiltrator stealth ship, two figures cut a focused and determined picture. There were Sergeant Marakira and Lieutenant Jonah Jackson, the chosen duo to lead this covert mission. Both were seasoned veterans from New Terra's most elite military unit, their reputation preceding them in every operation they undertook. Kira, the mission lead, was a master strategist known for her cool-headedness in the face of danger. Jackson, an expert in Veritan technology and language, was the perfect choice as her second in command. Both had been carefully selected not just for their skills, but their unwavering trust in each other, a bond forged in the crucible of countless high-risk missions. Their task was clear, locate and eliminate the high-ranking Veritan officer implicated in the failed assault on New Terra. The information extracted from the stealth ship's quantum computer had provided them the last known coordinates of their target. They were operating on a narrow window of opportunity, a high-stakes gamble in the grand scheme of galactic politics. As the stealth ship silently navigated the interstellar expanse, Kira and Jackson scrutinized the deciphered data from the infiltrator ship. They were acutely aware that their actions would have repercussions, not just for them, but for the whole human race. Every decision had to be made with meticulous precision and foresight. Days turned into nights, and nights into days as the duo traversed the cold depths of Veritan space. The advanced stealth technology of the ship worked flawlessly, rendering them virtually invisible to the standard Veritan sensors. However, the journey was not without its perils. Just as they were approaching a critical juncture, a Veritan patrol ship made an unexpected appearance on their radar. With its advanced sensor array, 
it had the capability of discovering their presence. A tense standoff ensued as Kira and Jackson switched the infiltrator systems to minimal, held their breath, hoping the infiltrator's stealth capabilities would hold up against the Veritan sensors. If they weren't, T looking for them, the ship should just pass right by. In the silence of the stealth ship's cockpit, seconds turned into an agonizing eternity. But the stealth held. The patrol ship passed by, unaware of the human presence. Their first test was passed, but Kira and Jackson knew the real challenge was yet to come. Back on the resurgence, humanity's beacon of hope and resilience cut a path through the cosmic seas toward Zeta Prime, anticipation and duty permeated its steel-veined arteries. On board, Admiral Ross, Ambassador Solane, and the newly appointed Ambassador Varro bore the weight of their roles. They weren't just delegates, they were humanity's representatives on the galactic stage. The ship bustled with preparations. While one team rehearsed diplomatic protocols and cultural nuances for the upcoming investiture ceremony, another team, led by Captain Davies, operated in the shadows. Their task was to prepare for a potential Veritan threat, a stark reminder of the tightrope humanity was walking between peace and conflict. Zeta Prime, a marvel of galactic civilization, loomed into view. The hollowed-out planet-turned space station, its spires reaching out like the fingers of a cosmic hand, was a testament to the collective ingenuity of the Galactic Council. Dotted with lights that rivaled the surrounding stars, it was a symbol of unity and progress, a stage set for humanity's long-awaited acceptance. Within the station's cavernous halls, a symphony of alien dialects echoed off the walls. Holographic screens scattered across the vast space displayed a complex web of interstellar politics and symbols and scripts alien to the human eye. Yet, among this tumult, a team of humans, including Ross, Solane, Varro, and Davies, stepped onto Zeta Prime, the weight of their mission evident in their determined strides. As they disembarked, the eyes of countless alien species turned toward them, their gazes ranging from curious to indifferent, a few palpably hostile. However, the human delegates held their heads high, undeterred by the daunting panorama of galactic diversity. Meanwhile, in another wing of Zeta Prime, the Galactic Council security team convened. This elite group, a potpourri of the finest warriors from council races, bore the responsibility of keeping peace within the station. Given the Veritan threat, the security team had called in the assistance of the human military delegation led by Captain Davies, his team's understanding of the Veritans deemed invaluable. The heart of Zeta Prime, the council chamber, was in a state of feverish preparation for the upcoming ceremony. Amidst the fluttering banners representing hundreds of civilizations, a new one stood out a brilliant blue globe against a field of white stars, the banner of humanity, a symbol of a new dawn. Yet, beneath the festive atmosphere, the station thrummed with tension. Rumors of a potential Veritan disruption had permeated the council, leading to hushed whispers and anxious glances. But the council was resolute, they would not allow these shadows to tarnish the ceremony's significance. As the eve of the grand ceremony approached, Zeta Prime hummed with escalating anticipation. The resurgence, nestled amongst a flotilla of interstellar vessels, stood tall. Its human insignia shone bright against the backdrop of the cosmos, a testament to a species ready to take their place amongst the stars. The resurgence hung in the black void, a sentinel from a once isolated world, now a part of a vibrant interstellar community. Aboard the colossal ship, the countdown for the grand ceremony had begun. The delegation of humans, who had only dreamt of this day, were a blend of nerves and excitement as they donned their formal attire, bearing the symbol of new Terra, and prepared for their historic moment. As the delegates readied themselves, in a different corner of the resurgence, Captain Davies and his elite squad were preparing for a mission of their own. They ran through simulations, refining strategies, and sharpening their skills, ready to counter any Veritan attempts to disrupt the ceremony. The juxtaposition of celebration and conflict was not lost on them, but they remained resolute in their duty to protect their people and their place in the council. Meanwhile, Zeta Prime buzzed with a frenzy of activity. The station's cavernous halls teemed with representatives of different species, their unique voices creating a vibrant, alien melody. However, amidst this chaotic harmony, the Galactic Council's security team stood out. An amalgamation of different species, they were alert and ready, their eyes scanning every corner for potential threats. To further secure the station, Captain Davies's team was now part of this critical security force. Their integration was a testament to humanity's commitment to the Galactic Council's safety and a significant move towards forging lasting relationships with other species. Even as the humans learned from the alien combat techniques, they shared their own expertise, demonstrating their worth as part of the Council's defense. The day of the ceremony was a sight to behold. 
Delegates from every corner of the galaxy filled the Grand Council Chamber, the distinct forms of vivid tapestry of the galaxy's diversity. As Ambassador Solane, Admiral Ross, and Ambassador Varro entered the chamber, they carried with them the hopes and dreams of all humanity. Their hearts pounded in unison with the pulse of New Terra, a rhythm that echoed across light years. As the ceremony began, the chamber fell silent, the anticipation hanging heavy in the air. The presiding council member, a being of shimmering light and ancient wisdom, began the age-old ritual, its voice resonating across the chamber. As the humans were called forth, the collective breath of hundreds of species seemed to catch in their throats. Meanwhile, amidst the pomp and circumstance, Captain Davies and his team stood guard, their eyes darting through the crowd, their senses heightened. The presence of the Veritans was palpable, their icy gazes a stark reminder of the lurking danger. Yet, the humans didn't flinch, standing firm and unwavering, ready to face any threat. The ceremony reached its climax as the human representatives, Ambassador Solane and Admiral Ross, flanked by Ambassador Varro, approached the council. Each step they took was a stride for humanity, bridging the centuries-long gap between their species and the rest of the galactic civilizations. Their hearts studded in sync with the cadence of human aspiration, their every breath an echo of humanity's collective anticipation. The council president, an ancient and revered being from one of the galaxy's oldest civilizations, rose from his levitating seat. Composed of shimmering fractals of light, their voice echoed throughout the chamber as they began to speak, on behalf of the Galactic Council, it brings us great honor to welcome the humans of New Terra into our midst. The journey towards us has been arduous and long, but their perseverance has led them to this moment. Today, we recognize the resilience and potential of humanity. We look forward to the wisdom and diversity they will bring to our council. Let us stand united in our quest for peace and progress. A profound silence followed their words, the chamber absorbing the weight of the moment. Then Ambassador Solane stepped forward. As he reached out to accept the emblem of council membership, a hush fell over the assembly. It was a sight that would be etched into the annals of human history. In the silence that followed, Solane cleared his throat and began to speak, on behalf of all humanity, we thank the Galactic Council for this honor. It is with great pride and humility that we accept our place among the stars. We understand the responsibility that comes with this membership, and we pledge to work tirelessly towards the common good of the Council. Together, we hope to contribute to the galaxy's story of unity, discovery, and progress. His voice echoed in the Grand Chamber, reaching every corner and every listening ear. A moment of silent acknowledgement followed before a wave of applause began, resonating throughout the Chamber, marking the official acceptance of humanity into the Galactic Council. As Ambassador Solane continued his heartfelt acceptance speech, resonating with solemn sincerity and steely determination, Captain Davies was standing at the periphery of the Grand Chamber, his sharp eyes scrutinizing every corner of the room. A part of the Council security force, his primary responsibility was to ensure the security of the proceedings. Suddenly, his trained eyes caught an anomalous movement in the shadows. He subtly signaled the rest of the security force, and they immediately moved into high alert. Davies discreetly navigated through the crowd, his gaze fixed on the source of the disturbance. In the meantime, Solane concluded his speech. Together, we stand on the threshold of a new era of galactic unity and progress. Let our story be a testament to all the civilizations that might follow in our footsteps. As the applause swelled around him, a sudden energy disturbance caught Davies' attention. His blood ran cold as he saw a group of Veritans brandishing concealed energy weapons. Their target was clear, Ambassador Solane. Time seemed to slow down for Davies as he propelled himself forward, shouting a warning that was swallowed by the deafening applause. The Veritans, their faces twisted in hate and defiance, took aim and fired. A scream echoed through the Grand Chamber as Solane staggered, a bright energy blast searing his shoulder. The echo of the blast marked the end of Solane's speech, a shocking betrayal of the peace they were celebrating. Chaos erupted in the Council Chamber. On the infiltrator ship deep in Veritan space, Sergeant Marakira and Lieutenant Jonah Jackson were busy deciphering the complex data streams on their mission to deliver a harsh lesson of poetic justice. The weight of their task hung heavily in the air as the stealth ship traversed the cold, uncharted expanse of Veritan territory. Their objective was clear but perilous, to locate and eliminate a high-ranking Veritan officer, the mastermind behind the thwarted bombing attempt on New Terra. The last known coordinates provided by the infiltrator's quantum computer were rapidly approaching, signaling their arrival at a strategic Veritan military spaceport. The spaceport, an enormous, fortified structure floating in the abyss of space, teemed with Veritan vessels of all sizes. Among them was their target, 
the command ship of the officer they were tasked to eliminate. From the schematics pulled from the infiltrator's data logs, it was a formidable spacecraft equipped with advanced Veritan technology. An ordinary approach would be a suicide mission. But Kira and Jackson were not planning an ordinary approach. Their eyes locked onto the holographic projection of their target ship, and Kira broke the silence. We only get one shot at this, Jackson. We have to attach the bomb without alerting anyone. Jackson, his fingers nimbly dancing over the control panel, nodded. The tension was palpable as he expertly maneuvered the stealth ship closer to the command ship. Their advanced stealth technology rendered them invisible to the standard Veritan sensors, but they were threading the needle, exploiting the Veritan's blind spots. The stealth ship approached the command ship, and Jackson delicately maneuvered it to attach the bomb, the exact same bomb intended for the resurgence, onto the command ship's hull. The mission was personal for them. It was not just about avenging a planned assault, but sending a message, loud and clear, humanity would not be intimidated. Their focus was absolute as they worked in concert, their movements choreographed with precision. Each second was invaluable, each action fraught with risk. It was a dance with danger on the most precarious of stages. And then, with a soft hiss, the bomb latched onto the hull. The first part of their mission was accomplished. Retreating to a safe distance, they watched as routine Veritan patrols passed by their target, oblivious to the deadly payload attached to its hull. Just when they were beginning to breathe a little easier, a Veritan patrol ship, equipped with more advanced sensor arrays, slowly approached the command ship. Kira's breath hitched in her throat, her fingers tightening around the armrest. The patrol ship was thorough, perhaps a routine check, but if it discovered the bomb, their mission would end in failure, and it could mean war. Jackson muttered under his breath, Come on, just move along, nothing to see here. As the patrol ship inched closer to the command ship, time seemed to stretch into an eternity. They could only watch, their hearts pounding, as their fate hung in the balance. The silence inside the stealth ship was deafening as Sergeant Marakira and Lieutenant Jonah Jackson watched the Veritan patrol ship inch ever closer to their target. The stealth technology had served them well so far, but they couldn't shake off the nagging dread that their mission could unravel at any moment. Patrol ship is on the move, Jackson finally murmured, his tone wavering between relief and disbelief. His words echoed in the small cockpit as they watched the patrol ship veer away, leaving the command ship untouched. The moment was nothing short of miraculous. Close call, Kira breathed out, breaking into a grin that mirrored Jackson's. Nice flying, Lieutenant. Anytime, Sergeant, Jackson replied, the corner of his mouth twitching upwards in a half smile. Their camaraderie, born from countless missions and shared perils, was their strength in such moments of high stakes. With the immediate threat behind them, Kira and Jackson turned their focus back to their mission. The bomb was attached and set to detonate once the command ship initiated its next jump to hyperspace, a failsafe designed to ensure it exploded far away from the spaceport to minimize collateral damage. However, their mission was not over. They still had to leave Veritan space unnoticed, a task as daunting as the one they just accomplished. For the next few hours, they navigated the labyrinthine network of patrols and surveillance systems. Through a combination of patience, skill, and sheer luck, they managed to weave their way out of Veritan space, leaving the ticking time bomb behind them. As the familiar sight of new terrorist defenses appeared on their radar, Kira let out a sigh of relief. We made it, Jackson. He nodded, visibly relaxing as he eased the ship towards their home base. Yeah, we did. They exchanged a glance, knowing well the magnitude of what they'd accomplished. They'd infiltrated Veritan space, planted a bomb on the hull of a high-ranking officer's command ship, and escaped undetected. It was a victory, not just for them, but for humanity as a whole. But it was a victory with a bitter taste, leaving them to question the cost of such a triumph in the silent recesses of their minds. Upon landing, they were met with a silent nod from General Henson, acknowledging the successful completion of their mission. The general's gaze held a mix of pride and melancholy, a reflection of the complexities of their actions. They debriefed, providing every detail of their mission, leaving out nothing. The stealth ship was put under rigorous examination, ensuring no trace of their covert operation remained. Kira and Jackson were dismissed, left to grapple with the aftermath of their mission in solitude. In their quarters, the enormity of their actions weighed heavily on them. Did we do the right thing, Kira? Jackson finally asked, his voice a mere whisper in the sterile room. We did what we had to, Jonah, she replied, her gaze fixed on the distant stars. As they retreated into their thoughts, the news of the successful acceptance of humanity into the Galactic Council reached them. Yet, their victory was overshadowed by the secret they carried. 
the knowledge of the bomb, silently ticking away in Veritan space, was a grim reminder of the fragile peace they were treading. They had made a statement, proving that humanity could strike as stealthily as the Veritans. But at what cost? The answer was left to linger in the silence, a haunting echo of their actions. The question now remained, when the bomb detonated, what would be the repercussions? Would their message be heard as intended, or would it usher a new era of conflict and mistrust? Only time would tell. In the heart of the Galactic Council Chamber, amidst the towering edifice of interstellar unity, pandemonium had taken hold. The shockwave from the Veritan attack was still resonating through the Grand Chamber as Captain Liam Davies found himself thrust into the epicenter of a brewing storm. The Veritan insurgents, having revealed their lethal intentions, brandished their energy weapons, their faces twisted masks of fanaticism. But they hadn't accounted for the swift, trained reflexes of Captain Davies and the Council Security Force. On your positions. Davies barked into his comms, his voice cutting through the chaos like a laser. Swiftly, he drew his own weapon, his eyes narrowing on the Veritans. Trained in the harshest of new terrorist terrains and seasoned in combat, he was a tempest in human form, undeterred by the enemy's numbers or their audacity. The Veritans, outnumbered but reckless, opened fire, their energy bolts lighting up the chamber in erratic streaks. But the Council Security Force was ready, and they retaliated in kind. Energy beams intersected and exploded in midair, creating a light show that would have been mesmerizing if not for the grave circumstances. With a feral cry, Davies launched himself at the nearest Veritan, engaging him in a hand-to-hand -hand combat that was more about survival than style. Davies' combat training kicked in, and within moments, the Veritan fell, his energy weapon skidding across the polished floor. The rest of the Council security force fought bravely, holding their line against the Veritan insurgents. Davies' courage seemed to have a contagious effect. Even representatives from other galactic civilizations, their own security forces joining the fray, looked at him with a mixture of awe and newfound respect. The tide of battle slowly began to turn. Despite their initial surprise attack, the Veritans were outnumbered and outmatched. One by one, they fell, incapacitated but alive potential sources of information on their motives and backers. As the dust settled, the chamber fell eerily silent. At its center stood Captain Davies, his uniform scarred by the fight, but his determination unwavering. The Veritan insurgents, once a threat to the entire council, lay in a disheveled heap, their failed mission echoing the futility of their violence. The fight had ended, but the real battle had only just begun. With the immediate threat subdued, the chamber's atmosphere, previously charged with frantic energy, transitioned into a taut silence. The echo of the last energy bolt dissipating still seemed to hang in the air, an audible ghost of the attempted assassination. Captain Davies, at the heart of the scene, slowly holstered his weapon, his eyes scanning the surroundings for any lingering threats. But the echoes of the skirmish quickly gave way to the murmur of unease. The Galactic Council Chamber, once a symbol of interstellar diplomacy, had been turned into a battlefield, the lingering remnants of the encounter etched into its grandeur. Aboard the resurgence, the Council's live broadcast of the admission ceremony had been abruptly replaced by a horrified newscaster, her eyes wide as she relayed the shock of the galaxy at the attempted assassination and the ensuing skirmish. Back in the chamber, Council President Lyrics, their light fractals swirling in a display of unease, finally rose from their seat. Their voice resonated through the chamber, this attack on Ambassador Solane and the Galactic Council will not be taken lightly. It is clear that this is an act of terrorism, carried out with the intention to disrupt peace and unity. We demand an explanation from the Veritans. The Veritan representative, their usually vibrant colors muted, stepped forward, their voice wavering. We had no knowledge of this attack, President Lyrix. We strongly condemn this act and assure you that we will fully cooperate in any investigations. However, Lyrix's next words were firm, their decision reflected in their brightening luminescence, until such time, your council membership is temporarily suspended. You will have no say in council proceedings until a full investigation has been conducted. Gasps filled the chamber, representatives of various galactic civilizations looking at the Veritan representative with a mixture of shock, suspicion, and in some cases, satisfaction. For centuries, the Veritans had been viewed with a mixture of respect and wariness due to their secretive nature and advanced technology. This incident had only served to heighten those feelings. Meanwhile, the wounded Ambassador Solane, supported by Admiral Ross, used his good arm to raise himself to his feet. Despite his pain, he addressed the remaining council members, his voice clear and steady, in the face of hostility, we have shown unity. Let this not be a setback, but a stepping stone towards a stronger bond among our civilizations. 
and to the Veritans, he paused, his gaze focused on the Veritan representative, your actions have spoken louder than your words today. You will face the consequences. As the broadcast came to an abrupt end, the galaxy held its breath. Ambassador Solane's brave words echoed through countless homes, ships, and planets. The Council's decisive action against the Veritan sparked conversations, debates, and apprehension. Ambassador Solane, previously known for his diplomatic tact and soft-spoken nature, had become a symbol of human resilience and bravery, his image forever etched into the memory of the galactic public. Meanwhile, the Veritans, their representative standing alone amidst the chamber, found themselves under the harsh spotlight of the galactic community. The stage was set for a political upheaval that would shake the galaxy's foundations. In the days that followed the incident, the Galactic Council was a whirlwind of activity. Diplomatic representatives from every member civilization had to reassess their relationships with the Veritans, while Council security worked tirelessly to ensure the safety of the members and scrutinize the event to prevent such attacks in the future. Despite being caught in the midst of the ensuing political storm, Ambassador Solane showed no signs of buckling under the pressure. His injury, a raw testament to the assault on the Council, did little to diminish his spirit. On the contrary, it seemed to fuel his determination, further burnishing his image as a figure of resilience and courage. As the Veritans faced the brunt of the political fallout, the Galactic Council expedited the investigation into the attack. While the Veritan government repeatedly claimed to be oblivious to the actions of the insurgents, evidence from the attackers, combined with their coordinated strike and advanced weaponry, suggested the involvement of a faction within their government. Solane, for his part, insisted on transparency during the investigation. He was often seen in public, discussing progress with his fellow council members or speaking with the galactic press. His words and actions were steadfast, striking a chord with the public across the galaxy. Justice will be served, he declared, and peace will be restored. Meanwhile, on New Terra, Solane's image was everywhere. His bravery and determination had ignited a spark among his people. Humans, who had been somewhat skeptical about their entry into the Galactic Council, were now unified in their support for their ambassador. Admiral Ross, always at Solane's side, became the tactical face of humanity. His strategic advice, combined with Solane's diplomacy, became the driving force behind the actions against the Veritans. With the new Terra Defense Force on high alert, Ross was often seen directing operations and ensuring their readiness for any possible retaliation. Back in the Galactic Council chamber, after days of deliberation and heated debates, a decision was finally reached. The Council President's voice resonated with a grave finality, based on the findings of our investigation and in light of the Veritan's inability to provide satisfactory responses, we, the Galactic Council, imposed severe sanctions against the Veritans. As the President's words echoed in the chamber, Solane stood tall, his gaze unwavering on the Veritan representative. This was not a moment of victory, but one of solemnity. A clear message to the Veritans, and indeed to all civilizations, that such transgressions would not be tolerated. As the council meeting drew to a close, Solane, supported by Admiral Ross, exited the chamber, his image broadcast live across the galaxy. Every step he took was a symbol of humanity's resolve, and each word he spoke was a promise of justice. The repercussions of the event were yet to unfold fully, but one thing was clear that the galaxy had changed, and humanity was at the forefront of that change. With the Veritans sanctioned and Solane's influence on the rise, a new chapter in galactic politics was about to begin. As the broadcast ended, the galaxy held its breath, waiting for what was to come. In the days following the chaotic attack on the Galactic Council, the corridors of the new Terra medical facility echoed with a strange, somber silence. Nestled deep within the hustle and bustle was a private recovery suite where Ambassador Solane rested, his shoulder on the mend after the brutal assault. The piercing pain of the energy blast had been replaced with a dull ache, a gentle reminder of the turbulent events that had transpired. Even in this recuperative solitude, Solane couldn't find solace. His mind was abuzz, caught in the intricate web of politics and plotting. As the human representative on the Galactic Council, his life had been perpetually spent under the spotlight. But this latest ordeal had pushed the boundaries like never before. His thoughts returned to the consequential day when this grand plan was conceived. It was a clandestine assembly within the heart of the human military command, attended only by a select few top brass. The objective was crystal clear to the Veritans, a race with which they now shared space in the Galactic Council. However, the humans harbored a profound bitterness towards them. This animosity was anchored not in recent altercations, but in the Veritans' actions centuries ago. 
The Veritans had upheld the Galactic Council's decree to annihilate all humans, a transgression that had etched a deep scar on the collective memory of mankind. Now, with this meticulously plotted scheme, it was time for retribution. Their plan was risky, yet ingeniously cunning. Using their elaborate network of spies nestled within Veritan society, they stoked the fire of Veritan hatred against the humans. Misinformation, sabotage, and whispered rumors were all part of their arsenal, ensuring the Veritans felt the sting of betrayal, whether real or imagined, and it had worked. The attack on the council chamber had shocked the galactic community, causing widespread outrage against the Veritans. The humans had won the first round of this dangerous game. As Solain mulled over the events, the reality of what they had done gnawed at his conscience. A part of him wondered whether their actions had pushed the boundaries of diplomacy too far. After all, they had manipulated an entire race, setting them up for a fall. But another part of him argued that it was a necessary evil, a path they had to take to secure their position and ensure human safety. His introspection was interrupted by the soft beep of his communicator. Solane sighed, shaking off his thoughts. His wound might be healing, but the battle was far from over. The games of intergalactic politics were just beginning. The next few days would determine the course of human veritan relations, shaping the future of the Galactic Council and, indeed, all sentient life across the cosmos. Their plan was set in motion, and there was no turning back now. Ambassador Solane's communicator beeped again, jolting him from his contemplation. He braced himself for the discussion to come. Varro, he said, recognizing the gruff veritan timbre without needing to check the caller ID. Solane, the veritan leader's voice was icy, laden with the weight of unspoken accusations. I am leaving for Veritan command. Solane took a moment to process the gravity of this statement. Varro's departure wasn't a simple return home. It was a severance, a withdrawal from the diplomatic commitments they had begun to forge. The bond they had started building mere months ago now felt tenuous, strained by the burden of the recent attack. I didn't wish for this, Varro. Solane finally managed, breaking the heavy silence. No, came the brusque retort. But it was your people who set it into motion. Varro's biting accusation hung in the air, a painful reminder of the deception orchestrated by Solane's own race. Yet, in the midst of the duplicity, Solane felt an unexpected pang of loss. Their fledgling friendship, born out of shared goals and mutual respect, was now on the brink of collapse. We may have anticipated that the Veritans were being led into a trap, he confessed, his words laced with regret. And yet, you stood by and watched, Varro countered, the bitterness in his voice palpable. The Galactic Council was meant to promote peace, Solane, not deceit. The humans have shown their true colors. Their conversation, once marked by camaraderie and shared aspirations, now echoed with resentment and recriminations. Solane could hear the undercurrent of disappointment in Varro's voice, reflecting the fractured trust between their species. My departure isn't just a return, Solane, Varro continued, his voice stern. It is a recall of all Veritan high-ranking officials. We won't stand by and let the humans tarnish our honor. We will prepare for any eventuality. The meaning behind Varro's words was clear. The Veritans were considering war. Their once promising alliance was on the verge of descending into a bitter rivalry. And so, we part ways, Solane, Varro's voice softened, a hint of the old camaraderie seeping through. We were friends, but it seems we are destined to become adversaries. The line went dead, leaving Solane alone with his thoughts. As he mulled over Varro's words, he was acutely aware of the precarious position the humans were in. They had made their move, and now, they had to brace themselves for the Veritan response. Despite the apparent success of their plan, Solane felt an unease settle over him. They had ignited this conflict, sown the seeds of mistrust. It was a perilous gambit, and Solane couldn't help but question, at what cost would their victory come? He knew that they had pushed Varro into a corner. And from his brief friendship with the Veritan leader, Solane knew one thing for certain, Varro would not back down without a fight. As Solane stared into the darkness of his chamber, a daunting realization dawned upon him, they had not averted a war, but rather, set the stage for one. The game was far from over, and Solane knew they were now walking on a razor's edge. On board the resurgence, Solane was preparing for his departure to the Galactic Council. His luggage was packed neatly, filled with important documents and information he needed for the upcoming meeting. The resurgence's deck, usually buzzing with activity, was eerily quiet. The crew's faces mirrored their leader's solemnity. Suddenly, an urgent message blasted through the ship's intercom. All hands, report to the main deck immediately. The voice crackled with tension. The message was clear, something was wrong. 
Solane quickened his pace, his mind racing through various scenarios. As he reached the main deck, a panoramic view of the vastness of space stretched out before him. The holographic screen displayed a wreckage field, remnants of a ship that was once a colossal masterpiece of Veritan technology. It was now reduced to a field of cold, lifeless debris, reflecting harsh, spectral light from distant stars. News feeds on the side screens filled in the horrifying details. The ship was the Veritan's pride, home to several high-ranking officials, all lost in the tragic accident. The feed suggested a catastrophic internal failure leading to the explosion, but no concrete evidence was provided. Solane's heart pounded in his chest, a mix of anxiety and exhilaration. The explosion was the culmination of a meticulously planned operation, one which he had a hand in, but it was still shocking to see the wreckage tangible evidence of their scheme. He then convened an emergency military meeting. Their next steps were crucial, the galaxy was on the edge of anarchy, and any misstep could plunge them into chaos. The main display came to life, showing a map of human-controlled space, an area far more significant than the Galactic Council might have imagined. Colonized worlds, space stations, and military outposts were marked across the sector. Allied alien races cohabited these territories under a federation with the humans. Alongside it, they showed the Galactic Federation's map for comparison. It was clear, the humans had grown far more widespread and influential in the last millennium, and this was something the Council was unaware of. As the meeting progressed, the sentiment of vengeance filled the room. We need to show the Veritans our strength, one general suggested. If only we could reveal it was us, another lamented. The room echoed with murmurings of agreement. As the meeting neared its conclusion, Solane's piercing gaze swept across the room. A palpable silence filled the air as he lifted his hand, making his intentions clear. All military forces within the Human Federation are to be put on high alert, he commanded, his voice resonating with an icy calm. We must be prepared for any outcome. His declaration echoed through the silent room, met by a resounding chorus of affirmations. Directives were swiftly dispatched to every human military installation and vessel within their territory. In response, the full might of the human military machine came alive. Battlecruisers, dreadnoughts, and destroyers, each entering a heightened state of readiness, their gleaming hulls humming with a sense of purpose and anticipation. An immediate recall order was issued for all military vessels, regardless of their operational status or current deployment. Patrol routes were abandoned, military exercises cut short, and long-range reconnaissance missions curtailed as every vessel began its journey back towards the border demarcating the division between Human Federation and Galactic Council space. Civilian ships and cargo vessels were not directly affected by this recall, yet the tension spreading across the human territories did not leave them untouched. Each vessel was advised to stay vigilant and cautious in these uncertain times, but they continued their regular operations, undeterred by the undercurrents of political upheaval. This hasty consolidation of military forces echoed a sense of foreboding across the human federation. Humans had instigated this situation, their desire for retribution against the Veritans for past atrocities steering them towards a path of potential conflict. As Solane watched the holographic display, his gaze fixated on the symbols representing their returning military vessels. He found himself hoping that the seeds they had sown would not grow into a devastating interstellar war. But if conflict was inevitable, he knew the humans were ready to defend their place in the universe and their right to justice, no matter the cost. As the echoes of Solane's order resonated throughout the vast human territory, far away on the homeworld of the Veritans, Ambassador Varro found himself amidst the military hierarchy of his people. The gleaming spires of Veritan military command rose around him, an emblem of their military prowess and a constant reminder of the past horrors his people had once inflicted. Inside the command center, the air was heavy with a tense quiet, punctuated by the low murmur of military officers discussing the calamity that had befallen them. A holographic projection at the center of the room displayed the scattered remnants of the Veritan ship that had been lost. As he joined the gathering, he was updated on the situation. There were whispers, veiled suspicions of possible human involvement. They had no direct evidence linking the humans to the catastrophe, but the weight of the circumstantial evidence was daunting. The abrupt hostility, the secretive nature of the humans, the unexplained departure of the humans from the Galactic Council just before the incident, it was all too coincidental to be dismissed. Varro stared at the holographic representation of the destroyed ship, its debris field scattered across the silent void of space. If these suspicions turned out to be true, if the humans had indeed instigated this, it would mean only one thing, war. The notion sent a shiver down his spine, but he also felt an odd sense of resolve hardening within him. 
He had believed in peace, in diplomacy, and in the power of shared history to bridge the chasm between their races. But if it was war that humans wanted, then it was war they would get. The Veritans would not back down, not this time. As the meeting continued, the discussions shifted from recovery efforts to strategic planning, from rescue to retaliation. The air in the command center grew colder, the weight of their decisions pressing down on them. The tension in the room was palpable, a storm was brewing, and it threatened to engulf the entire galaxy. In the days and weeks leading up to the attack at the Galactic Council, Ambassador Varro was kept in the loop by the Veritan intelligence branch of the military. Within the cryptic shadows of Veritan's central intelligence hub, streams of data flowed from his network of clandestine agents, sketching a concerning picture of human subterfuge. These regular reports, painting an alarming image of human meddling, came not just from Veritan spies, but also from a handful of species within the Galactic Council. These races, bound to humanity through mutual interests, had begun to voice their disquiet. Doubts about the nature of their alliance had led them to leak critical information, casting the humans in an ever-growing shadow of treachery. Varro's concern heightened with every piece of analysis shared by the Veritan intelligence chiefs. They had dissected the humans' actions and discovered an insidious plot, a malevolent design aimed at inflaming Veritan radicals. The humans, it appeared, intended to spark a conflict within Veritan society, destabilizing them from within. The incident in the Galactic Council was no random act of extremism, it was a manipulation, a puppet show choreographed by the humans. The weight of this understanding fell heavily on Varro. He replayed his last conversation with Solane, recalling his cryptic warning, your people set it into motion. Solane's acknowledgement of the impending Veritan trap served as a chilling admission of his role in the deception. With his heart pounding, Varro was painfully aware that the risks had multiplied and his people's future was teetering on the brink. He was now entangled in a high-stakes game, facing not just human cunning, but also duplicity from within the Galactic Council. Solane stood on the bridge of the resurgence, staring at the hollow feed showing the vast debris field of the destroyed Veritan ship. He wore a solemn expression, his heart feigning a rhythmic ache of empathy. We extend our deepest sympathies to our Veritan allies, he spoke into the interstellar channel. We stand ready to offer any assistance necessary in this difficult time. Across the vast expanse of the cosmos, on the Veritan home world, Ambassador Varro watched Solane's address with icy eyes. He stood rigid in the command center, the holographic image of Solane projected onto the room casting an eerie glow. His jaw clenched as Solane offered condolences and aid. It was all too convenient, too opportune. The humans' offers of help were quick to come, suspiciously so. A few days later, the Galactic Council assembled for a special session. The atmosphere was tense, each representative carrying the weight of the recent catastrophe. Solane, the human ambassador, walked in confidently, the picture of diplomatic grace. Yet, underneath the facade, he was a chess player ready to make his move. Varro, the Veritan representative, was also present. He bore the heavy burden of his people's loss, and his gaze never strayed far from Solane. Each word spoken, each expression exchanged, only fueled his burning desire for retribution. His heart seethed with betrayal, his veins pulsed with a fervor for vengeance. As the session commenced, the rising hostility was palpable. Solane's eloquent speech masked his people's hidden intentions, speaking of peace, unity, and cooperation. The Veritans, however, saw through this charade. They were not the instigators of war, as the humans painted them to be, and their recent actions were taken out of a need for self-preservation. The meeting moved into its critical phase, the council members engaged in a fervent debate over the crisis. Varro's mind, however, was elsewhere. He could feel the scornful glances, hear the whispered allegations, the Veritans becoming scapegoats for a crisis they didn't instigate. Despite his position and authority, Varro felt helpless. His people were being accused, and the evidence against the humans was circumstantial at best. The stage was set, the players in place, and the Galactic Council watched on, blind to the dangerous game being played. Varro retreated to his quarters after the meeting, the weight of the day's events heavy on his mind. His reflection stared back at him from the metallic surface of his desk, a beacon of hope for his people amidst the rising tide of accusations. As the last echoes of the Council's debate faded away, Varro's sense of betrayal grew stronger. He was not a man driven by hatred, but he was also no fool. He had seen the dark undercurrents of the humans' diplomatic front, the veiled threats and cunning manipulation. His people were being cornered, and he knew he had to act. But how? In the end, Varro found himself standing at the crossroads of diplomacy and revenge. 
The once clear boundaries between friend and foe were now blurred, and his next move could either save his people or plunge them into a devastating war. This was the dilemma that kept him awake at night, the question that haunted his every thought. As the first part of this chapter came to an end, the tension between the Veritans and the humans had escalated to dangerous heights. A silent storm was brewing, and the Galactic Council was caught in the middle, oblivious to the catastrophic storm that was about to break. Varro was left alone in his quarters, his mind buzzing with strategic plans and possibilities, while his heart yearned for justice. His people were counting on him, and he would not let them down. Varro stood in front of the massive windows of the Veritan Command Center, gazing out into the sprawling space landscape. In the light of recent events, he felt a growing sense of unease, an uneasy anticipation of what was to come. Despite the bitter accusations, the Veritans had to tread carefully. They were in the Galactic Council's crosshairs, and any wrong move could lead to their expulsion. The human offer of assistance, though seemingly generous, only fueled Varro's suspicion. It was as if they were setting a trap, luring the Veritans into accepting their help only to twist the narrative later. Every instinct told him it was a ruse, a cleverly veiled ploy. Yet, there was no solid evidence, and without it, any counter-accusation would appear as an attempt to shift the blame. Back at the Galactic Council, the discussions were reaching a fever pitch. The humans, seemingly undeterred by the mounting tension, made a bold move. Solane, with an air of unflappable calm, suggested a military resolution. The human forces, he proposed, could lead a joint investigation into the Veritan ship explosion, offering their technological prowess and strategic expertise. The proposal was met with a chorus of mixed reactions. Some members of the Council viewed it as a proactive move, a chance for the humans to prove their commitment to peace and justice. Others, however, saw it as an aggressive overture, a thinly veiled attempt to assert their dominance. As the news of the proposal spread, Varro's heart sank. It was a masterstroke, a move designed to paint the humans as the peacekeepers while placing the Veritans under further scrutiny. With the Galactic Council watching, he could not openly retaliate without jeopardizing his people's standing. In the privacy of his office, Varro's usual stoic demeanor gave way to a storm of emotions. His fists clenched, and his mind seethed with fury. The humans were exploiting the situation, playing their cards with unnerving precision. The sense of helplessness was unbearable, but Varro knew he had to maintain control. His mind raced, exploring strategies and outcomes. He could see the precipice they were being pushed towards an all-out war. But it was a path he hoped to avoid. Not out of fear, but because he understood the astronomical cost such a conflict would demand. He was a Veritan, a race known for their wisdom and foresight. He would not be goaded into a hasty response. As the chapter drew to a close, the state of intergalactic relations hung by a thread. The humans had effectively turned the tables, placing the Veritans in the proverbial hot seat. The whispers of a potential conflict were growing louder, the shadow of war looming ominously on the horizon. Varro was left alone with his thoughts, the burden of his people's fate resting on his weary shoulders. The situation had reached a critical juncture, and his next move would inevitably shape the course of the Galactic Council's history. And while the odds seemed stacked against him, Varro was determined to fight till the end. Meanwhile, Solane looked out of the Resurgence's bridge, his expression unreadable. The Galactic Council was buzzing with his proposal, the next moves were being calculated, and the board was set. The tension was palpable, the stakes higher than ever. It was clear that the humans were not just players anymore, they were becoming the puppet masters, and the galaxy was their stage. The air in the Galactic Council chamber was thick with tension, much like the charged atmosphere before a storm. High-ranking officials and dignitaries from numerous worlds sat in anticipation, their various eyes, antennae, or whatever sensory organs they possessed, trained on one figure's Solane, the human ambassador. Varro, his Veritan counterpart, sat at the opposing end of the chamber, his gaze fixed on the human. His eyes, normally calm and unreadable, simmered with a quiet rage, barely kept in check by the diplomatic veneer he had meticulously cultivated over the years. His mind, however, was a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions, his desire for retribution clashing against the political restraints of his position. Despite his thirst for vengeance, Varro knew he was in a precarious situation. The Veritans' place within the Galactic Council hung in the balance, their reputation tarnished by recent events. An open act of aggression against the humans, especially without substantial proof of their guilt, could lead to their expulsion. A diplomatic solution was the only feasible course of action. Solane, completely aware of the charged atmosphere and his adversary's glaring gaze, rose to address the assembly, projecting an aura of calm composure. 
His voice resonated through the silence, weaving a narrative that expertly danced on the fine line between insinuation and accusation. In light of the recent events and escalating tensions, the Human Federation believes that it is incumbent upon us to ensure the safety and stability of Galactic Council territories, he began, his gaze sweeping across the attentive faces. He paused for effect, letting his words sink in. The room remained deathly quiet, every word carrying the weight of potential war or uneasy peace. We propose a military resolution. The Galactic Council should permit the Human Federation to station our forces at strategic locations around Veritan territories, Solane continued, his tone steady and composed. A ripple of surprise and shock ran through the assembly. The audacity of the suggestion was breathtaking. Solane, however, did not falter, confidently maintaining eye contact with the other ambassadors. This is not an act of aggression, but rather a protective measure. Our presence will act as a buffer and peacekeeping force, deterring any potential acts of aggression. The room erupted into a cacophony of hushed whispers, indignant protests, and surprised exclamations. Some council members nodded in agreement, appreciating the logic behind the seemingly preposterous proposal. Others, especially those who had long-standing ties with the Veritans, immediately recognized it as a veiled threat. Varro's gaze remained locked on Solane, his insides churning with a turbulent mix of anger, surprise, and grudging admiration. The human had played his cards well, spinning a narrative that not only defended his race, but also placed them in a position of potential power. This chapter ends on a cliffhanger, leaving the fate of the human proposal and the future of the Veritan race hanging in the balance. Tension is high, with the undercurrents of war starting to ripple through the Galactic Council. The game of interstellar politics is only just beginning, setting the stage for a potential conflict that could ripple across the cosmos. As the whispering crescendo of reactions reached its peak, the room fell into silence once again when the council chairperson, a being of regal poise from the peaceful planet of Keels, called for order. She took in the assortment of representatives, each dealing with the aftershock of Solane's audacious proposition in their own unique way. We shall discuss this proposal in detail, she stated, her tone bricking no argument. In the cold stillness that followed, Varro could almost hear the cogs of diplomacy grinding against the sands of time. The audacity of the humans, suggesting such a resolution, could not be understated. However, the manner in which it had been done was an art of persuasion in itself. The Veritan ambassadors seethed silently. As much as he wished to lash out, to expose the humans for the snakes he believed they were, he could do little more than tighten his fists under the council table. His political acumen told him that any outburst now would only strengthen the human's position. In contrast, Solane, having delivered his earth-shattering statement, wore an expression of calm self-assurance. The human's placid demeanor, amidst the turbulent sea of political unrest, added to the growing divide between the two ambassadors. The days that followed saw a frenzy of diplomatic negotiations, secret meetings, and tense discussions as the council debated the human's proposal. Some members saw the human's demand as a necessary step towards ensuring galactic peace. Others considered it a power move, an act of concealed hostility against the Veritans, cleverly packaged as a protective measure. Varro watched it all unfold, his resentment towards the humans growing with each passing moment. His desire for revenge became a gnawing itch in the back of his mind, an insatiable hunger for justice. But he had to be patient, to bide his time until the perfect moment presented itself. As the deliberations continued, the balance of power in the Galactic Council remained precarious, like a cosmic tightrope walker, maintaining a delicate equilibrium. The human's bold proposal had effectively thrown a spanner into the intricate machinery of intergalactic politics. Its ramifications were beginning to reverberate across the cosmos, shaking the foundations of alliances and stoking the flames of latent animosities. The deliberations in the Galactic Council continued, a war of words replacing the silent tensions that had previously hung heavy in the air. As representatives from each member state voiced their arguments and counterarguments, a new development arose that threatened to shift the narrative once again. In the far reaches of Veritan territory, a salvage team was conducting a painstakingly slow and meticulous search of the debris field from the destroyed Veritan ship. It was a grim task, made even more difficult by the stark reality of what had transpired. Each piece of wreckage was a somber reminder of the lives lost and a grim testament to the escalating tensions. On the third day of their search, they found something. Buried beneath layers of twisted metal and scorched debris was a small, unassuming object. It was a stark contrast to its surroundings, its surface clean and smooth. It was the ship's black box, a buoy designed to survive even the most catastrophic of events. 
The box was quickly transported back to Veritan home world, where it was received with a mixture of anticipation and dread. This little device held the answers to the many questions that had haunted the Veritans since the incident. It held the truth. As the recorder's stored information was cautiously extracted and decoded, a narrative began to take shape. Initial data painted an unsettling picture. The explosion wasn't an unforeseen accident or a result of equipment malfunction. Rather, it was initiated by an external entity, a clear act of sabotage. Intriguingly, the recorder contained misaligned sensor readings that traced back to the time when an unidentified object, likely the explosive, was affixed to the ship's hull. In addition, the recorder detected a mysterious, anomalous surge of energy outside the ship just before the calamitous explosion. As this revelation dawned upon the Veritans, the air seemed to leave the room. The implications were severe and immediate. If proven, this could tip the scales in their favor in the ongoing deliberations. However, it also meant acknowledging a horrifying reality. They had been attacked, and war could be imminent. Ambassador Varro received this news with a stoic calmness that belied the storm raging inside him. As he stared at the data, his mind raced with possibilities, scenarios, and most importantly, strategies. This was the evidence they needed to expose the humans, but he had to act carefully. The chapter ended with the Veritans holding onto a potential game changer, the black box from the destroyed ship. The tension had escalated, the stakes had risen, and the weight of the truth bore heavy on their hearts. As the Galactic Council continued their deliberations, a new player had entered the board, undeniable evidence of foul play. The stage was set for an even more explosive reveal, and the galaxy held its breath. Ambassador Varro's Deliberations as the setting sun painted the Veritan homeworld skyline with a splash of vibrant hues, Ambassador Varro found himself by the floor-to-ceiling window of his office, gripped by a contemplative silence. The usually bustling cityscape below now resonated with an air of somber resolve, mirroring the escalating intergalactic tensions that were seeping into the Veritan society. Varro, a seasoned diplomat and a veritable pillar of the Veritan community, was no stranger to the burdens of his position. Yet, the revelations from the data recorder had infused a newfound gravity to his responsibilities. The stakes were higher, the implications far-reaching, and the decisions to be made fraught with unanticipated complexities. He was at the precipice of a decision that could alter the fate of his people, and the weight of it was almost palpable. Inside his office, Varro assembled his strategic planning team. The grim reality of the situation reflected in their eyes as the magnitude of the latest findings dawned upon them. Our ship's destruction was not accidental, Varro began, his voice reverberating through the room. We have been targeted, and the evidence we possess implicates the humans. Murmurs of disbelief and concern permeated the room. The humans, despite their diplomatic tiffs with the Veritans, were still seen as potential allies. The notion of accusing them now felt like a deep-seated betrayal, a sentiment Varro himself grappled with. Before the dismay could fully set in, Talia, the head of Veritan intelligence, intervened. There's no definitive proof, she cautioned, slicing through the room's tension with her pragmatism. Doubt is a luxury we can no longer afford, Talia, retorted Varro. His gaze hardened as he continued, but you're correct. We need to confirm our suspicions before launching official allegations. In the midst of these strategic debates, Varro found himself wrestling with the personal implications of the situation. The memory of his time among the humans of their kindness, their indomitable spirit, and their capacity for empathy had fostered a deep respect for them. The thought of them as potential aggressors was unsettling, yet he was reminded that interstellar politics seldom presented a clear picture. An update during the meeting added another layer of complexity to their predicament. A thorough review of the sensor logs from a Veritan ship that had swept the area before the disaster revealed an anomaly to shadow, nearly imperceptible but distinct enough to be noticed on a careful observation. The data was immediately relayed to the military's elite unit, and their response added fuel to the growing fire of suspicions. The shadow was identical to their own stealth ships, the very type they had used to plant the bomb on the human flagship. Yet, as far as they knew, the humans still had possession of that captured ship. It was a chilling realization that pointed an accusing finger directly towards the humans. The room fell into a stunned silence at this revelation. The evidence was mounting, the situation rapidly evolving, and the path ahead increasingly murky. As the meeting adjourned, Varro found himself alone in his office once again, the city's glow outside his window a stark contrast to the darkness of their situation. Varro knew, as the city continued to shine against the falling night, so too would the Veritans, no matter what lay ahead. 
he would ensure that his people would navigate through this tumultuous phase, guided by unity and resolve. His role, more crucial now than ever before, was clear. The night was just beginning, and he had a job to do. Preparing for war, the Veriton Military Command Center was a beehive of activity. Overhead screens displayed readouts of the Veriton Space Fleet's current status, a swarm of officers coordinating operations from the center's nerve hub, and the air was thick with a tense mixture of dread and determination. Supreme Commander Lycon, the Veriton military's seasoned leader, stood in the center of the commotion, his gaze transfixed on the display screens. His mind was busy constructing a strategy, already considering various scenarios, from surgical strikes to full-blown warfare. The recovered data recorder had delivered the ominous possibility of war straight to their doorstep, and he intended to be prepared. Lycon was not a man who took lightly to the prospect of conflict, but he was no stranger to it either. The glint in his eyes spoke of countless battles fought, victories earned, and lives lost. The stakes were different now, more personal. The enemy was not some faceless entity lurking in the unknown regions of space, but a race they had known, negotiated with, and considered a potential ally. The news from Varro's meeting had made it to him, and the shadow on the censors only intensified the seriousness of the situation. If it's war they want, he thought, clenching his fists, then we'll give them a war they won't forget. He directed his officers to prepare their forces for potential mobilization. Resources were reassigned for weapons production and ship fortification. Planetary defense systems were recalibrated, and military outposts on the fringe worlds were put on high alert. But preparing for war was not just about strengthening their military prowess. Lycon knew he had to rally public support for the cause. He addressed the Veriton populace, his words echoing through every home, every public square, and every corner of the Veriton homeworld. His speech was a call to unity, reminding them of their strength and resilience, and the necessity to stand against those who threatened their peace. As he spoke, he was aware of the fear and uncertainty reflected in the eyes of his people. He felt it too, but war was not a time for fear. It was a time for unity and resolve. His words were designed to kindle hope, but more importantly, they were a grim reminder of the reality they were now facing. The message reverberated throughout the Veritan society, igniting a spark of unity among the populace. Families huddled together around their holographic screens, holding each other tighter as Lycon's voice filled their homes. It was a chilling moment, one that marked the potential end of peace and the possible beginning of an unwanted war. Despite the gravity of the situation, a sense of camaraderie and resolve seeped into the fabric of the Veritan society. From the bustling city centers to the quiet rural outskirts, Veritans braced themselves for the upcoming storm. The fear was there, but so was the determination to stand together, to protect their homeworld, their way of life. As the preparations gained momentum, and the Veriton homeworld stood on the brink of conflict, Lycon found himself back in the command center. The once steady hum of the center was now a roaring orchestra of strategic war planning. The screens flickered with their defense readiness, and his officers moved with newfound urgency. As the reality of war loomed closer, Lycon could not shake off the image of the shadow on the censors. If the shadow indeed belonged to a human stealth ship, it meant they had already infiltrated their space. This was no longer a question of if but when the war would start. He let his gaze linger on the screens one last time before he turned away, the echoes of a potential war resonating within the walls of the command center. The Veritans were ready. They had to be. The future of their civilization might very well depend on it. Operation Shadow Veil Aboard the Phantom, a stealth ship retrofitted with salvage technology from the Veriton Infiltrator, a team of human operatives readied themselves for a covert operation. This mission, an echo of the Veriton's brazen act of sabotage against the resurgence, had high stakes. A small Veriton frigate had drifted too close to human space, and the Phantom Division, under the command of Admiral Sandra Kane, was tasked with capturing it. The Phantom was a testament to human ingenuity and adaptation. While human forces had access to their own stealth technology, the confiscated Veriton infiltrator had presented novel design elements and advanced tech that they'd integrated into their own systems. The result was a fusion of human and Veriton engineering, an invisible, silent predator. Their target was a small Class B Veriton frigate, lightly armed and manned by a skeleton crew of 20. The aim was to take control of the vessel without alerting the Veritans, an operation as delicate as it was dangerous. As the Phantom neared its target, a palpable tension filled the stealth ship. Every crew member on board knew the plan, silence, speed, and precision. 
an EMP device specifically designed to disrupt Veritan systems temporarily without causing permanent damage, was at the heart of their strategy. The EMP device, a product of intensive study of the Veritan infiltrator, was small but potent. Attached to a boarding pod, it was set to activate the moment they attached to the Veritan frigate, creating a brief window of chaos during which the humans could board undetected. With the Phantom veiled by advanced cloaking and moving silently through the blackness of space, the EMP-equipped boarding pod disengaged from the stealth ship and made its way towards the unsuspecting Veritan frigate. As the pod latched onto the alien vessel, the EMP device activated and the frigate was momentarily plunged into darkness. Back on the Phantom, Admiral Kane watched the frigate go dark. It was the signal they'd been waiting for. The boarding team moved swiftly, exploiting the brief period of confusion on board the Veritan ship. Armed with non-lethal weapons, they infiltrated the vessel, disabling the crew before they could fully comprehend what was happening. In less time than it took for the Veritan ship's systems to reboot, the frigate was under human control. Admiral Kane let out a breath she hadn't realized she was holding. Phase 1 of Operation Shadow Veil was a success. The crew quickly set to work, studying the Veritan technology aboard the captured frigate while simultaneously setting a course deeper into Veritan territory. This captured vessel was a goldmine of information and potentially a weapon, a Trojan horse ready to strike at the heart of the Veritan military if necessary. Back in the council chambers, Ambassador Solane's datapad blinked with an encrypted message. Falcon has the nest. The operation had been successful. As he absorbed the implications of this success, he steeled himself for the battle to come. The humans had demonstrated they were no pushovers. The Veritans may have initiated this game of cat and mouse, but humanity was proving they could play just as well. The balance of power was wavering, and the next move would be critical. Accusations and dispersions. The Galactic Council Chamber was fraught with anticipation as Ambassador Solane prepared to take the central platform. The faces of representatives from countless intergalactic states bore expressions ranging from curiosity to apprehension, a testimony to the escalating tension. Solane took a deep breath, stealing himself. He was about to voice allegations that could possibly spark a conflict on a galactic scale. Esteemed members of the Galactic Council, Solane began, his voice echoing through the silent hall, we have gathered here to seek truth and justice. To understand the cause and the potential instigators of the tragic incident involving the destruction of a Veritan vessel, a holographic display blinked to life at his command, showing security footage of Veritans bringing weapons into the council chamber. The sacred ground of this chamber was violated by the Veritans, who dared to bring weapons onto this hallowed soil. Such actions speak volumes of their lack of respect for our collective values. The murmurs that arose at this proclamation were quickly hushed as Solane continued, but their transgressions don't stop at dishonoring this chamber. I stand before you as a testament to their direct aggression towards humanity. The display changed, showing evidence of the failed assassination attempt on his life. This is the evidence of a failed attempt on my life, orchestrated by the Veritans. It is an unprovoked attack on the peace that we've been striving to maintain. The display transitioned once more, this time to sensor logs and images of the Veritan stealth ship, the infiltrator, that was discovered trying to plant a bomb on the resurgence, the human flagship. They've infiltrated our space, deployed stealth ships with the aim to sabotage our flagship. This level of aggression is simply unfathomable. Finally, Solane paused, taking a moment to let his words sink in. The chamber was eerily silent as he presented his final piece of evidence, the report on the Veritan ship's explosion. The Veritans are now facing an internal crisis. Our analysis suggests that the ship's destruction could be the result of internal subversion, a terrorist act perpetrated by their own kind. This indicates a severe failure on their part to maintain internal order. He stepped back, letting the full weight of his accusations settle on the assembly. We stand here, at a crossroads. The Veritans have shown repeated aggression against humanity, even as they are unable to maintain peace within their own ranks. They violated the sanctity of this council, threatened our lives, and jeopardized interstellar peace. He raised his gaze, meeting each representative's eyes. The evidence is undeniable, the pattern of aggression clear. And so, I ask you, in the face of this escalating hostility, what are we to do? What would any of you do? As Solane retreated from the platform, the chamber broke into a flurry of whispers and hushed conversations. The galaxy teetered on the edge, its fate hanging on the council's next decision. The specter of war loomed, its shadow cast over the tense faces of the representatives. The die had been cast, the next move was up to the Veritans. Summary 
In a tense series of events, the Galactic Council continues its deliberations about the Veritan ship's destruction amidst rising accusations and evidence of foul play. Veritan Ambassador Varro grapples with the implications of this data, as does the Veritan military as it begins preparations for a potential conflict. Meanwhile, a secret human operation successfully infiltrates and commandeers a small Veritan frigate using stealth technology inspired by the Veritan's own infiltrator ship. Amidst these developing situations, human ambassador Solane stands before the council, painting a damning picture of the Veritan's recent actions, from weapon smuggling to assassination attempts, and hinting at internal strife within the Veritan ranks. The accusations hang heavy in the chamber, leading the council to the brink of a major decision. The deliberation and the decision. The galactic council chamber hummed with tense energy. The hollow displays scattered around the room painted a picture of a crisis, the epicenter of which was the Veritan Empire. At the heart of the chamber, holographic representatives of diverse civilizations from across the galaxy deliberated in an array of languages subtitled in real time across the council chamber's displays. The crisis had been coined the Veritan Affair. The bombing of a major interstellar trade hub, a gruesome act traced back to Veritan space, but without a clear perpetrator, had triggered a cascade of events that shook the very foundations of the galactic community. And it was left to the Galactic Council to make a decision that would shape the course of events. After hours of deliberation and negotiation, the decision was reached. A wave of silence spread across the chamber as the Council's adjudicator rose to announce the judgment. We have reached a decision. The human ships shall be the peacekeepers in Veritan space. Their task shall be to aid in the operation to identify those responsible for the bombing, ensure safety of travel, and conduct routine ship searches for any contraband and nefarious items. As the words reverberated through the chamber, expressions varied from relief to shock, and in the case of the Veritans, clear displeasure. Yet, the decision was made. The humans had offered their assistance willingly, painting themselves as the neutral and trustworthy party. No one had strong grounds to object. The Council's decision was followed by an immediate recall of ambassadors from Veritan space. Meanwhile, human ships began to mobilize, moving swiftly into Veritan territory, like pawns advancing on an interstellar chessboard. They strategically took up positions around Veritan's planets, trade routes, and hyperspace waypoints. The peacekeeping mission had begun, but to some, it felt more like the tightening of a grip on Veritan space. The humans were diplomatic, professional, yet subtly assertive in their operations. Their ships, resplendent in the gleaming colors of the United Human Federation, were imposing figures against the backdrop of the cold, dark expanse of space. The Veritans, accustomed to their autonomy, watched helplessly as the peacekeepers took charge. A grudging sense of acceptance slowly took root, but beneath the surface, tension simmered. As this transformation unfolded, another plot was set into motion in the shadows. A stolen Veritan ship, under human command, prepared for an operation that could drastically tilt the balance of the unfolding crisis. The objective was clear, frame the Veritans as the aggressors, deepening their crisis and thereby tightening human control. From the command center of the Veritan Empire to the highest echelons of the Galactic Council, all eyes watched the Veritan space with bated breath. As the galaxy found itself on the brink of a major upheaval, only time would reveal the true victor in this dangerous game of power and politics. However, one thing was certain. The Galactic Council's decision had set in motion a chain of events that could irreversibly change the fate of the Veritans, the humans, and indeed, the whole galactic community. The players had made their moves, now it was the time for the game to unfold. A game of shadows. The vast expanse of Veritan space was eerily calm. The once bustling trade routes, vibrant with multitudes of ships and echoes of vibrant conversations, had muted into a tense quietude. With the human peacekeeping fleet patrolling the territory, an unsettling peace had descended upon the Veritan Empire. Their imposing vessels, now familiar fixtures across the skies of Veritan worlds, were carrying out their duties without incident. Routine ship searches, control of hyperspace waypoints, and a reassuring presence along the trade routes had begun to restore a semblance of order and calm in the wake of the crisis. However, beneath this facade of peace, a sinister plan was brewing. A stolen Veritan ship under human command had laid dormant in the farthest reaches of Veritan space, far from prying eyes. The crew, a select group of human special forces trained in Veritan operational procedures and language, were preparing for their mission. A carefully orchestrated assault on their own ship to further incriminate the Veritans in the eyes of the galactic community. The moment of action arrived. 
the stolen Veriton ship powered up its engines, veering into the path of an unsuspecting human vessel. Communications were swiftly jammed, leaving the targeted vessel isolated, unable to call for immediate help. On board the stolen Veriton ship, cloaked in the abyss of deep space, the stolen Veriton frigate, now under human command, lay dormant. The crew, a cadre of human special operatives, studied the approaching human cruiser with laser-focused intensity. The moment they'd been meticulously trained for was about to unfold. The screens blinked with real-time data, showing their target growing steadily larger, its hull glowing under the spectral light of distant stars. The tension in the frigate's command center was palpable, electric with anticipation. Power up, ordered the commander, a man named Diaz. The ship hummed into life, its systems pulsating with energy as they prepared for the incoming assault. Shields up. Weapons ready. A symphony of affirmative acknowledgments answered his orders. With the quiet intensity of a hunting predator, the stolen Veritan ship veered off its course to intercept the human cruiser. Diaz glanced at his weapons officer, a woman named Lennox, and gave a decisive nod. Fire, he commanded. The ship's weapon systems, primed and ready, unleashed a blistering barrage of phaser fire and plasma torpedoes. Space around the human cruiser erupted in brilliant explosions, the vessel staggering under the sudden assault. A visible shudder rippled through its hull as it struggled to maintain its integrity against the unexpected onslaught. Cease jamming, Diaz ordered as the human cruiser reeled from their attack. Almost immediately, a distress call blared from their comms, frantic voices pleading for help as they came under fire from what they believed to be a rogue Veritan ship. The stolen ship continued to assail the crippled human cruiser, but with far less potency now. It was a charade, a convincing display of sustained aggression designed to convince the incoming rescuers of Veritan hostility. As soon as sensors detected approaching vessels, Diaz initiated the final phase of their plan. Lifecraft, now, he barked. The crew sprang into action, swiftly abandoning their stations to rush toward the lifecraft docked along the frigate's side. The commander was the last to leave the bridge. He paused at the controls, programming a delay into the ship's autofire sequence. The stolen Veritan ship, now deserted, would continue its assault, further cementing the illusion of Veritan aggression. With the lifecraft safely away from the frigate, the crew watched as the ships arrived at the scene of their manufactured conflict. They had timed it perfectly. The stolen Veritan frigate fired its weapons again, right on cue, and then, moments later, the human cruiser retaliated. On board the human ship, the impact was staggering. The stolen Veritan ship shattered into a thousand fragments, creating a dazzling, if chilling, spectacle of destruction. The crew watched from the lifecraft as they zoomed away, their mission a resounding success. A perfect ruse executed flawlessly, setting the stage for a monumental shift in galactic power dynamics. Aboard their lifecraft, heading toward the beleaguered human cruiser, the special operatives couldn't help but feel a cold satisfaction. The Veritans had been dealt a crippling blow, one they might never recover from, and the galactic chessboard had been dramatically upturned. The human crew aboard the stolen ship had already evaluated, leaving only the Veritan crew on board to perish and take the blame. In the confusion of battle and with the sensors of all the ships overloaded, the lifecraft silently docked with the human ship. The whole event was a brilliantly executed deception, a silent manipulation that further pushed the Veritans into the villain's role. As the dust settled, news of the incident quickly spread across the galaxy. The Galactic Council, the Human Federation, and all other civilizations stood in shock as the Veritans were accused of a direct attack on a human vessel. The Veritans, stunned and bewildered, could only watch in despair as their predicament worsened. The Veritan ship that had arrived at the scene of the attack confirmed the human narrative of an unprovoked Veritan assault, unintentionally and unknowingly driving the final nail into their own species' coffin. The Veritans were entangled in a game where all the cards seemed stacked against them, and they didn't even know it. This new incident was just the latest move in a grand cosmic chess match where they, unfortunately, were the pawns. The Veritans fall. The Veritans fall was swift, like a bright star collapsing into a black hole, consuming itself in a violent, uncontrollable implosion. The Galactic Council, their trust in the Veritans shattered by the seemingly irrefutable evidence of the assault, issued a harsh decree. The Veritan Armada was ordered to stand down. All military operations, from interstellar patrols to internal security missions, were to be halted immediately. Their fleet, once a symbol of their might and power, now sat dormant, floating like ghost ships in the vast expanse of Veritan space. The sight of these mighty vessels, stripped of their purpose, was a poignant reminder of the humiliation suffered by the Veritans. 
The silence in the Veriton corridors of power was deafening, a chilling testament to the dire straits they found themselves in. News of the incident spread through the cosmos like wildfire, with each galactic race taking note of the rapid change in the political landscape. The humans, now seen as the victims and peacekeepers, were reassigned to replace the Veritans as the Galactic Council's wardens. The sanctions imposed on the Veritans were severe. Their representation in the Galactic Council was suspended, diplomatic travel limited to dignitaries and their families. Trade sanctions were put in place, a harsh blow to an empire that thrived on commerce. The Veritans were isolated, their once bustling ports silent and empty. They were trapped in a gilded cage of their own making, or so it seemed. Meanwhile, the humans wasted no time in capitalizing on the situation. Their fleet moved into strategic positions within Veritan space, solidifying their influence and control. They stepped into the role of peacekeepers and security enforcers with apparent ease, a silent testament to their meticulous planning and foresight. In the midst of this upheaval, however, the Veritans were not entirely alone. Some races within the Galactic Council saw the situation for what it was, a blatant power play. There were whispers of doubt, of dissent, but these were drowned out by the chorus of outrage against the Veritans. To the Veritans, this turn of events was nothing short of catastrophic. Their once prized reputation lay in tatters, and their empire was on the brink of collapse. They were a race defeated, their spirit and resolve tested like never before. Yet, the Veritans were a proud people. They would not bow down, not without a fight. Secret meetings were held in the shadows, whispers of a plan to retaliate against the humans. Yet, the odds seemed insurmountable. With their military crippled and their people demoralized, their chances of success were slim. However, there was one thing that the Veritans still had in their possession, knowledge. They knew their territory like the back of their hand, every star, every planet, every hidden nook and cranny. As the galaxy watched, they braced themselves for the next chapter. The Veritans had been defeated, yes, but they were far from out. The galaxy had seen many empires fall, only to rise again. Would the Veritans manage to do the same, or was this truly the end of their era? Only time would tell. Resilience and Resolve A summary of the dramatic events that had unfolded was broadcast throughout the galaxy. It began with the heinous bombing within the Galactic Council, the damning security footage implicating Veritans in the act, and the subsequent investigation that pointed fingers at a rogue faction within the Veritan race. The intense negotiations at the Galactic Council that resulted in human ships taking up peacekeeping roles within Veritan territory were also recapped. The explosive assault on the human ship by the stolen Veritan vessel was then detailed, accompanied by chilling footage of the human ship's distress call echoing through space. The eventual arrival of a Veritan ship and human vessel, and the subsequent destruction of the rogue Veritan ship at the hands of the human fleet, were presented as evidence of the Veritan's transgressions. With the damning corroboration by the other Veritan ship that witnessed the unprovoked attack, the fate of the Veritans seemed sealed. The repercussions for the Veritans were monumental. Their military forces were ordered to stand down, their representation within the Galactic Council was suspended indefinitely, and crippling sanctions were imposed on them. Veritan space, once a bustling hub of activity, had grown ominously silent. Meanwhile, human ships took over strategic positions within Veritan territory, taking up the mantle of peacekeepers and law enforcement, further consolidating their newfound power and control. The universe watched as the tides turned, the balance of power shifted, and a new era seemed to dawn. Despite this grim situation, the Veritans refused to bow down. Behind closed doors, they began to strategize, their resolve unyielding. They understood their territory, knew their people, and despite the demoralization and loss, they weren't ready to accept defeat just yet. Rumblings of a counter-strategy began to echo in the hallowed halls of the Veritan Command Center, a desperate hope amidst the despair. And thus, the stage was set for the next chapter in this galactic saga. A proud race brought to its knees, a rising power seizing control, and a universe watching the drama unfold with bated breath. The Veritans, battered but unbroken, were preparing to fight back, while the humans, triumphant and strategic, were ready to cement their position of power. The echoes of this cosmic power play continued to reverberate through the vast emptiness of space. In the grand scheme of the universe, this was but a speck of dust, a fleeting moment. Yet, to the inhabitants of the Galactic Council's numerous member worlds, it was a saga of resilience and resolve, of treachery and deceit, of power and politics. The story was far from over, the final chapter yet to be written. And as the universe continued its celestial dance, all eyes remained fixated on the unfolding events, wondering what the morrow would bring.